Hello again, friends! <coughs> and you are our friends. And welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's Nasal Cavity, right here, <laughs> wherever you find us on this fine day. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. We are packed with topics, questions, not really anything to review, but a lot going on in the world of wrestling, and a lot that everyone's waiting to hear. This man opine on the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. Opine? I'm now an opiner? I feel like I've been thrown from a moving train. And it didn't help that you started that introduction with that pixie-ish giggle in your voice. The tone of you, the frequency of you, caused me to momentarily guffaw. We get no laughing here on this program today. It's a serious situation here. God damn it. Already off the air, you've tried to sing like Bob Dylan, and I've talked about my nasal cavity. So what more? You tried to sing like Bob we... Dylan first, for the record. Well, I sounded more like Bob Dylan used to than you did like he does now. Well, that's what I said I was doing. I was doing Bob Dylan yeah. now, so for the record. But I sounded more like he used to than you did, so you sounded like he does now. Neither one of us were very Dylan-esque. Well, again, that's your opinion. You are opining. and I'm opining here today, and we're going to review something. We're going to talk about Briscoes and FTR, for heaven's sake. By God, North Carolina. So we're going to review something for once that people might want to hear about, since I'm sure it probably got the lowest viewership of all of the AEW-affiliated programming last week, since it was a Ring of Honor pay-per-view from... Arlington at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, and the match was advertised 48 hours ahead of time. But why be picky? Lots of good things going on. By the way, I want to thank everyone, the good feedback, and also our friends over at Inside the Ropes magazine across the pond over there in Great Britain, the UK, and those environs. Uh, I was the cover girl for this for this month's. Uh, issue and apparently it was the largest pre-order they've ever had and i haven't heard about the newsstand sales but we've gotten a lot of feedback about it from people on twitter i got my copy you can hear the accent even when they write it on twitter i got my copy and i i'm i'm looking jaunty and fit on that cover also the fine photography of Hotchkiss Featherbottom, by the way. But I want to thank Kenny McIntosh and Dante Richardson and Finn Martin for, I don't know if he conducted the interview or more or less ducked out of the way of it, but uh, we got a lot of good feedback on that. A Finn Martin production. A Finn Martin production. He had no idea what I was talking about when I hit him with that 20 years ago for the first time. Uh, did you hear Dick Van Dyke, 97 years old the other day? All right. At there you go. Dick Van Dyke is going to make it to 100. He's still dancing and stuff. Like, he has a group that he sings with. He's insane. He's just, he's, he's not human. But that just goes to show what fucking Mary Tyler Moore for all those years will do for you. Uh, they, they couldn't sleep in the same bed. Do you think British people should be offended by his accent and Mary Poppins? Not any more than English, than American people are. I think it, Do you, you think know, American but, people should be offended by his British accent and Mary Poppins? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want, but it's still, it's a classic. It is. I agree. It's a classic. And that, uh, Captain Lou, that's another, Dick Van Dyke was one of his favorite subjects for his, one of his, remember I've told you he would tell the same joke every time you saw him and you had to laugh because it's Captain Lou, right? And the one about is, you know, is that shirt waterproof? Because that ties a real pisser. You know, the 47th, ah, Lou, you're the great. But that his also, another one of his favorite lines was, you know, Dick Van Dyke had to change his name to make any money. When he started out, he got nowhere under his real name, Penis Van Lesbian. And then you had, yeah, I'm not Captain Lou, so I guess you don't feel the need to laugh. Penis my lesbian! Like, how did he say that? He, just, he you know, said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly as he said, you know. He didn't make any money under his real name. He had to change his name. His real name was Penis Van Lesbian. And then he returned to whoever was next to him. that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as I said, I feel like I've been thrown from a moving train. 
because yesterday was the last decent weather day I think we might have for the next week or so. It's turning cold. It's raining, pouring rain. It's going to snow flurry this weekend. But I got outside and I did the, the final once around the house for the wintertime. The, you know, my leaf guy, Leaf Garrett, they took care of the leaves. And I've had the Monroes out here. They've got the uh, the creek running properly. Everything's taken care of except there is a giant red oak tree on my, in my neighbor's yard, but it's closer to his property line to me than it is to his house. It's right outside my garage entrance, and that thing dumps leaves until Christmas Day. It's a, it's 120 feet tall, and I love the tree, but goddamn, every time I get my leaves cleaned up, here comes some more. And it gets to the point where it's, it's January. I'm trying to be out there raking leaves or whatever. But I got some of that straightened up. Got all the, the yard tools put away for the winter. Wheelbarrowed around the house. Considered it a, a wonderful day. And today I can't move without feeling like I was just in the double dog collar match with FTR and the Briscoes. So these are the prices you pay when you get to my advanced age. But it's your show, right? That's right. I should mention, before I give you back your show, that uh, for the fine customers of Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com, I will have you know that not only has Hotchkiss Featherbottom picked up everything that has been ordered that needs to be autographed through Saturday morning, December the 10th, and just a couple of days ago, but he's making another pickup in a couple more days and everything through, wait a minute, let me see where we're at today. Everything through Thursday the 15th will be in the hands of a feather bottom by Friday the 16th. And that's as close as we can come, folks. If you haven't ordered by now, you'll still get it, but you probably ain't going to get it by Christmas. You know how the, how the, the uncertain state of the world these days. But thank you so much for everyone for making this a wonderful Christmas season for the people in your life that you have Jim Cornette merchandise on the way to. And just of an FYI, if you want to shop after Christmas, we're going to be open all Christmas week. And then we are closing the store from January 1st through the 8th uh, so that we can restock, recount, re-inventory, and get a grip on ourselves. Hotchkiss is going to grip himself. I'm going to grip myself. There's going to be none of this cross-gripping going on. So I just wanted to get that out there. All right, well, can we get your grip off this show? Can we have a good show? Can we have some fun here? Oh, so it'll be, it'll be a great show as soon as I quit talking. Is that what you're trying to say now? Well, as soon as you let go, as soon as you let go of the grip of the show, I think well, it will I'll pick up. I'll have you, I'll grip you in some places. Well, there's a lot of stories here to try to get the grip on. I don't even know where to start. Let's start, I guess, with what should be the biggest. If it isn't the biggest, it probably is. Although, <laughs> for reasons... Although it might not be. <laughs> well, although people are jumping on one thing more than Judge the other Mantel thing. Judge Mantell was doing commentary on Smoky Mountain Wrestling one time, and he said something to the effect of, well, so-and-so is taller than so-and-so, but so-and-so is heavier than so-and-so. Of course, that makes sense, because if they weren't, they'd both be the same size. And we just put a little graphic down at the bottom of the screen. So what in the world is Dutch talking about? Well, the article in the Wall Street Journal, WWE's Vince McMahon faces fresh demands from women alleging sexual abuse. <laughs> Actions come as wrestling company board assesses damage caused mm -hmm. by the former CEO's secret hush packs by Joe Palazzo and Ted Mann. And... There's a few interesting things here to talk about. One, there's more, by the way, just the fact that there's more. This is a dip. Well, one of them's the same, but one of them's a different woman that wasn't involved in the other. Where was our tote board? $21, $22 million. And this one, uh, one of these wasn't even involved in that. What the, f it, this would make a nice muscular dystrophy telethon total at this point. Go ahead with the Wall Street Journal. Well, let's talk about this article. There's a separate thing in the article that a lot of people have jumped on and made the story, as opposed to the idea that there are now two women, once again, <laughs> going after Vince McMahon. I shouldn't even say that. Rita Chatterton 
Apparently, he was going after them instead of the other way around. Rita Chatterton is going to go after him. They're going for a lawsuit right now because New York State's opened that up so that she actually can. This other woman we're just finding out about for the first time, but Rita Chatterton, as you said, we've known about since at least 92. We've known this was her story, but here's the Wall Street Journal. Vince McMahon, the majority owner and former chief executive of World Wrestling Entertainment, is facing legal demands from two women who allege that he sexually assaulted them, according to internal documents and people familiar with the legal negotiations. Let's stop there. Remember, we still haven't discovered who leaked everything the last time. So someone yeah. leaked all this again this time. Uh, if, instead of, I wonder if Deep Throat was the uh, Watergate stooge. I wonder if this is going to be Leaky Lip. Whoever, uh, who knows about all this shit? Who has known that could leak all this stuff? That would be interesting. Find out how big that circle of trust is. Well, again, it said according to internal documents, so that's someone with access to internal, I'm assuming internal means internal WWE documents, so it could be someone from the board yeah. once again. And in November 3rd, demand letter to Mr. McMahon's representative, a lawyer for former wrestling referee Rita Chatterton asked for $11.75 million in damages after she publicly accused Mr. McMahon three decades ago of raping her in a limousine. Mr. McMahon has long denied the accusations. The demand letter was reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. In a separate November email to Mr. McMahon's attorney, a lawyer for a former spa manager said that Mr. McMahon assaulted his client in 2011 at a California resort, an incident previously unreported in the media. Now, remember, this is not the, there was the report of the tanning salon person, and that was in Florida. That was Florida, yeah. Now, it's a spa resort or resort spa employee in California. It, it, he was on a fucking reign of terror with the fucking, I wonder when he went to fucking Target, did he ask the cashier for, you know, shit? He certainly seemed to try this in spa-like settings, or what? The other one was a tanning salon, right? Yeah, but it was a, it was the same. Th did this one also say something about candid photography of himself on his phone? Well, let's continue on here. The private communications between lawyers for the women and Mr. McMahon's longtime attorney Jerry McDivitt come as WWE tries to move past Mr. McMahon's forty-year tenure as the company's leader and into a new era. Mr. McMahon retired as WWE chief executive and chairman in July amid a board investigation of sexual misconduct claims against him and after the journal reported that he agreed to pay more than $12 million in secret settlements since 2006 to suppress such allegations. And, and by, the, by the way, it's a, a journalistic, a piece of journalistic integrity that the Wall Street Journal always refers to people as Mr. or Ms. or whatever, Mrs. But in this case there, it sounds like they're referring to him as his gimmick, fucking Mr. McMahon. Hey, this may be weird <sighs> semantics, but did he retire or did he resign? I was under the impression he resigned, and there is a difference. Well, Stephanie said he retired. And he said he retired on Twitter, but wasn't it reported, and I don't know the specific ins and outs of the proper way to do this when you're the chairman of the board or whatever, but he had to, he had to resign his position, whether it was uh, not mandatory or not voluntary or not, he still had to resign to be out of that position to retire, whatever. Is this help me? Help me! Jump back, want to kiss myself. I think you can help yourself right there, but to go back to what this just said, the private communications between lawyers for the women and Mr. McMahon's longtime attorney, Jerry McDivitt. So it was one of those parties that sent this to the Wall Street Journal, or if the board of directors is informed of that because of Vince's role, one of them could have done it again. Because, again, it kind of seemed like the first round was sent to get Vince out of the way. It was yeah. leaked to the Wall Street Journal by someone who said, you know what, enough. We need to do something else. 
So it's important to say that because this is getting leaked again. The board well, invest- <laughs> go ahead. The board investigation found that the payments to the women, though made by Mr. McMahon personally, should have been booked as WWE expenses because they benefited the company. A related board probe seeks to assess damage caused by Mr. McMahon's secret pacts and to determine whether legal action against him by the WWE board is warranted, said people familiar with the matter. That would be interesting. Can you imagine? Oh, I can see Vince's head exploding if somebody on the WWE or anybody employed by the WWE or involved in the WWE tried to sue him. Good God. That would be a Frank Sinatra level fucking blow up. You may be wondering what everyone's saying about this. Spokesman for WWE and the company's independent board members declined the comment. Mr. McMahon declined the comment. Mr. McDivitt didn't respond to requests for a comment. WWE has declined to discuss the allegations against Mr. McMahon. The company previously said it was cooperating with the board inquiry and taking the claim seriously. Stephanie McMahon, Mr. McMahon's daughter, and former WWE president Nick Khan succeeded Mr. McMahon as co-chief executives, but Mr. McMahon remains the company's largest shareholder. So, once again, let's point that out, because we've said it before. He's not there. He's not actively involved. He's the company's largest shareholder. Yeah, and and not even close. It's like, you know, 80% or whatever, right? With everybody else splitting up the rest. So, it's not even that close in terms of who's... They couldn't even pull a Georgia deal like, well, when you get... You know, uh, uh, the Briscoe's points and you get Ted Oates and you get, you know, this guy, then we can get it away from Barnett or Ole or whatever. It's not even like that. He's outranks everybody if they teamed up against him. So, but uh, that's the thing is, is this being leaked again because of the other conversation that everybody's talking about that we've, that Vince is now saying, ah, oh, you know what? <laughs> Bad advice. I should have let the whole thing blow over. It would have been fine. And maybe I just need to come back. And we'll talk about that end of it, because that is, again, the thing that everyone's jumped on. But let's continue with the main thing, which is about the investigations into women. We'll come back to that. Mr. McMahon has told people he refuses to pay settlements to Miss Chatterton and the former spa manager. People familiar with the comments said, WWE's auditor... Deloitte and Touche, LLC. <laughs> Wait, what? Or Deloitte and Touche, LLP. Touche. I don't. I never heard of anyone having that as an actual name. How is it spelled? T O U C H E. Touche. Touche, but there's no <laughs> indication mark over the E or anything. But anyway, <laughs> there's no drama over the E. Has advised. Suse, it's Suse. Is what Egbert Suse. Deloitte and Touche. LLP has advised the company that resolutions of the claims, even if confidential, would possibly have to be disclosed by the company publicly, said a person familiar with the matter. Deloitte didn't respond to comment, as everyone else didn't do. But what did Touche say? Touche has nothing to say. It's like Salino and Barnes. You know about what happened with them, right? Do you know oh, about I remember George, George Barnes, Bill Dundee's old partner? Do you know Salino and Barnes? I mean, they were a big law firm up here, but were they nationwide? Like, did you know who they were? No, I've never heard of them. Thankfully, I've never had to retain their services. For years, like their commercials were everywhere. And they had a jingle that everyone knew and they were there smiling and they had this big law firm and they kept like getting custom phone numbers and they got bigger and bigger. And then the partners started fighting and they hated each other and they broke apart. And one of them still on TV doing the same kind of commercials. <laughs> the other one, his plane crashed and he died. Well, that's a fucking bummer of a fucking finish to the story. Let's go back to the story here. <sighs> Miss Chatterton, now 65 years old, was the first female referee in what was then called the World Wrestling Federation. She alleged in two televised interviews that Mr. McMahon raped her in the back of a limousine in New York in 1986. She said in the 1992 interviews that Mr. McMahon told her she had to satisfy him if she wanted a $500,000 contract with WWF. 
WWF stopped booking her for appearances after the alleged rape in 1986, she said. The World Wrestling Federation changed its name to WWE in 2002. Ms. Chatterton's lawyer, John Clune, wrote in a legal demand letter that the damages to Ms. Chatterton from the alleged rape were hard to overstate. The letter said she had suffered years of ongoing depression, substance abuse, disordered eating, lost income, and an overall decreased quality of life. Wait a minute, what did you say? Disordered eating? That's what it says here, disordered eating. All right. <laughs> I never That's heard it put that way. Stick in there. Right, okay, go ahead. Ms. Chatterton referred the journal to Mr. Clune, who's her attorney, who declined the comment. New York State recently opened a one year window that allows victims to file sex abuse lawsuits based on decades old claims. The look back window is part of the Adult Survivors Act, a law signed by the New York governor earlier this year. Mr. McMahon alleged in a 1993 lawsuit that Ms. Chatterton was induced to make a false rape charge against him by a former wrestler with an axe to grind. Doesn't say it here, but I believe David Schultz was the wrestler Vince <laughs> accused of that. The lawsuit said her attorney at the time demanded $5 million from Mr. McMahon to keep Ms. Chatterton's allegations off the air. WWF dismissed her because she was a danger to herself and others in the ring, Oof. according to the lawsuit, which Mr. McMahon withdrew in 1994. Wait a minute, she didn't look like a shooter to me. You mean she was just going off and stretching people and shit? Is there any, to argue that in any way, is there any kind of way you could see that making sense, that the referee was a danger to others in the ring? I, 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 I'm trying to grasp for one. Um, I mean, you know, if if they were asking her to cooperate in convoluted spots, possibly that she it was over her head, and I don't think that that, since that didn't really happen back in those days with any referees in the WWF, I don't think that would be the case. So I'm possibly just because of her uh, uh, perceived lack of ability at her job or whatever reason they were trying to come up with to say that they didn't book her anymore. It goes on a little bit more, and again, this is a long article, and everyone should check it out, the Wall Street Journal, but... They say that she passed the polygraph test, that she has multiple sources who corroborate her account. Here's where I mentioned there was a run-in. Well, see, and remember when we talked about the, the last time that everybody was talking about all the horrible things Vince has done. Um, I don't doubt that it probably happened. The only thing that I've found strange or off-putting about it was that anybody, even a beginner at that point in the wrestling business, would have believed that Anybody, much less a referee, was going to get a five hundred thousand dollar a year contract. But I guess some people do smoke the hopium. But otherwise, I can believe that the incident took place in nineteen eighty six. Realistically, in WWF, and I know you weren't there, but you have an idea of things. Whoever the highest paid referee was, how much do you think they made in nineteen eighty six? Oh, well, um, when was the twin rev? That was eighty seven. That was eighty eight. Or 88, the twin referee. Th I'm sure both the Hebners got a, a decent little bonus for that. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's, who was the top referee? Was it Joey Morella? Was it 40 grand a year? Oh, yeah. No, it, it, here's the thing. Some of the guys, and actually Joey Morella was one of them, uh, died in the accident. He was driving one of the ring trucks, right? Or Because a lot of the referees. I thought it was him and Bruno. Well, no, you know what? He was in a car that time. But where I was going with this was a lot of the referees at that point in time also were ring crew guys who would be driving the ring truck or helping set up, and that's that augmented their pay. I can't say in the middle of the 80s with business that hot that the best referee in the company wasn't making a hundred grand, although maybe whoever the top referee was will call me up and say, bullshit, they gave me 75 or 80 or whatever the fuck. But Somewhere around there, but not anywhere near, you know, $500,000 or, and, and no guarantees. You had a salary as if you remember the ring crew, but the referees got paid on the house shows like everybody else, just not as much. But there's probably never in history been a referee that made $500,000 a year, right? No, not in, let's say, special referee Bret Hart in WCW. 
And then maybe he got 500 grand, the amount of money they were paying him, and he got hurt right after. Maybe if you amortized it, but no, not any, no, no. This is where we get a really interesting run in here with probably the worst defense you could use. John Wisniewski, <laughs> who wrestled as Greg Valentine, told the journal that Miss Chatterton disclosed the allegations while the two were sharing a marijuana cigarette in a Marriott hotel parking lot in Albany, New York, in the 1980s. It's always good when somebody corroborates a, a story by saying, yes, I remember we talked about it while we were sharing mind-altering drugs. Mr. Wisniewski said he didn't believe Miss Chatterton then or now because he didn't think she was attractive enough for Mr. McMahon. Oh, boy. Jesus. <laughs> wow. Wow. wow, it's been nice knowing you. Um, oh boy, it, it, I mean, I know he's still doing some fan fest, but I don't know what else he might get canceled over that. But hey, if you're in fucking, I believe it was in Poughkeepsie. I've been in Poughkeepsie. I've been to a couple of the fucking diners in Poughkeepsie. Uh, and and after the shows in Poughkeepsie, anybody that Vince could get back in the limousine was, I'm sure, at that point, after a number of beverages, was attractive enough for him. Oh God! Like if, if, you know, Vince only picks the the real, you know, cream of the crop there. Well, again, I'm surprised out of nowhere, Greg Valentine appears for a yeah, paragraph yeah. and then he disappears. <laughs> Never to be seen or heard of in the story again. And again, it goes a little further into uh, Mario Mancini, who uh, his real name, Leonard Inzitari, I believe, corroborates that she told him she was a part of uh, that Tony. He was a part of that Tony Altimore school, I believe, with uh, where David Schultz was. So a lot of the people in that camp say it happened and she talked about it and then Others, like Greg Valentine, have very interesting defenses. The former spa manager alleges she was assaulted by Mr. McMahon in, a 2000, in 2011 at a five-star resort in Southern California. While he was Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was it in Rancho Cucamonga? No. A it was a five-star resort? I doubt Vince would go someplace like Rancho Cucamonga, but it was a five-star resort in Southern California while he was in town for a WWE event. It'd have been six stars if it was in Tokyo. The spa manager reported... They the, rub you the right way over there. The spa manager reported the alleged assault... I shouldn't laugh while I'm reading this, and you just come with the fucking punchlines. The spa manager reported the alleged assault at the time to the resort. According to people familiar with the matter, the spa manager also told her husband about the incident. Some of the people said... He, oh, this this is a good part. This is a good part. Get to the good part. He drove to the WWE event with a baseball bat and tried to confront Mr. McMahon, but was turned away, according to these people. How the fuck did this not make some fucking news? Especially in the close proximity to Rancho Cucamonga and Campbell by the Sea, that some guy shows up looking for Vince with a baseball bat, and I can imagine it. Trying to get into the building when you work there, and 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 you go to these buildings every week, and the maze of labyrinthian corridors and etc. And following the signs for catering and Vince's office, I'm picturing some guy with a fucking baseball bat walking around from place to place. Where's Vince McMahon? Where's Vince McMahon? Everybody, like, what the fuck? That had to be fucking classic. The woman's lawyer, Michael Bresler has been in touch with Mr. McMahon's attorney since at least July, according to people familiar with the discussions. California, like New York, has a new law that allows alleged victims of sex abuse to file lawsuits that would otherwise be barred by the statute of limitations. Starting in January, victims will have a one-year window to file such claims. And you know what? Here's the thing. This is the perfect time because, let's face it, it's Vince McMahon in, in, what was this, 2011 that the incident at the spa took place? The alleged incident, yes. The alleged, the incident was alleged or alleged incident or whatever. There, there had been no mainstream reporting like there has been this year of Vince McMahon being a horn dog 
and throwing his millions around like candy at a fucking strip club. So who's going to believe if this spa, uh, you know, unknown anonymous spa employee says, oh, Vince McMahon, this 60-something-year-old at the time billionaire executive, just tried to show me his tally whacker or whatever the fuck went on. Nobody would have, it would have been, you know, bullshit. And then she might've got fired or from her job at this five-star resort. But now that the pattern has been established, as they say, and the modus operandi is a little more public, they probably feel, yeah, now they'll believe me because he's done it fucking 15 other places. So, uh, ay, ay, ay. so again this got into the wall street journal and i mean again this is not like some goddamn you know 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 year old movie star hollywood director celebrity it's a goddamn executive of a wrestling company that qualifies if you don't know him personally you just say vince mcmahon 60 fucking 70 he's a goddamn elderly billionaire what the fuck right Oh, I, how much more of this shit is going to... I wonder if Kentucky ever passes that law. They'll pass that law when they get around to passing a law of, against marrying your cousin when she's under 13, but... Well, he's done it to talent. And the thing is, you have to imagine that if you're someone who's still active in the business and most people don't go away, this may not be the kind of thing you want coming out about you. So you have to think there are probably people who don't want it out. There's going to be people who say, you know what? If this happened to them, you know what? This happened to me. I now have a chance I can go after them or I can at least get some attention on this. But there's also going to be people who, based on the fact it's happened to so many people, there's also going to be people who don't want it out there and aren't saying anything. Yes, but only if they don't want $11 million or whatever the fuck it is. Only if they work in a spa or if they're a female I'd wrestler. Pissed, I'd be pissed right now if I found out that he did the same thing to me that he did to somebody else, somebody else got $10 million and I got a fucking hearty handshake. That I'd be exceptionally pissed. Let me go, Jim, to another thing from this article that everyone's been talking about. Once again, the Wall Street Journal, the article, WWE's Vince McMahon faces fresh demands from women alleging sexual abuse by Joe Palazzo and Ted Mann. And in the article, it states... The 77-year-old Mr. McMahon has also told people that he intends to make a comeback at WWE, according to the people familiar with his comments. He has said that he received bad advice from people close to him to step down and that he now believes the allegations and investigations would have blown over had he stayed, these people said. That's the Vince I know. Sadly, that's a fascinating paragraph in the middle of a very sad overall story. But a lot of people have focused on that, and that's become the lead story. Vince planning a comeback. And then we can go into, you talk about leaking here. Who leaked that, that knew about that to the Wall Street Journal, A? And B, who does Vince blame? The people very close to him that gave him the bad advice. Well, one would think the advice was coming from inside the house. But it, it, I don't think that was the only place that advice was coming from. He probably... I, as some people that would give him the same advice, he wouldn't blame them as much as like, people close to him. That's who he would blame for the advice because they should have known better. But that's the Vince that I knew and worked with. De deny 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 do what you want to do it's all going to blow over move forward whatever the fuck however you want to describe that and i think it's probably coming from what have we said vince wasn't gonna not work vince has been working on something he's probably been working on figuring out how to get back to work but he's been working on something he has been occupying his time with something and or whether it's dwelling on what happened and say, well, because Jesus Christ, shit does blow over. Uh, at various points, a lot of people have been the, you know, the worst person in the world and, and canceled and nobody wants to hear from them again. 
and then suddenly they're back doing commercials or yeah, whatever. They're, they're back on Raw suddenly. And there's, or suddenly they're back on whatever the case. But in the you know in this case, Vince is probably he didn't think that as as we saw from the first couple of appearances he did on television, he thought it was going to blow over. He wasn't going to put it over. Then someone got to him with how serious it was and that this is going to be bad if something doesn't happen, and he acquiesced to it. And then probably whatever point in time that he, after that, however quickly it was that he started getting bored and or ruminating about it, and now he wants something to fucking do. <laughs> and you cannot stop Vince McMahon, like I said, from either working or working on a way to start working again. And he still owns everything. And he still owns everything. But that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, the feeling or the expression that I would expected, you know, from him to, you know, God damn it. God damn it, pal. Should have just waited. The whole thing would have blown over. It's a big, it's a witch hunt. I can see, I can see him doing the Trump thing. But now that we're here and we were going to really look at it and evaluate it, there's two different ways we could look at it. One is it good or bad for the company for Vince to be actively involved in anything right now? And two, is it good or bad creatively for the company for Vince to be actively involved in anything right now? Well, I think the questions to, or the answers to both those questions have come when, as soon as that article was released and that statement from Vince was in there, the stock price went down a couple dollars. And secondly, all we've been doing is talking about for the past couple months now or more guys want to go back and work for triple h i think he's brought back some that he probably has buyer's remorse on bringing back now what he was rid of but they want to come back and work for him and some more will follow and you know regal and etc we'll talk about that they didn't want to work for vince because he had gone out of his mind and max dupree was an example of whatever the fight and, and Ezekiel and Elias and Elrod and Elrod Hubbard, his manager. So no, I think it's, it's bad creatively because raw is not setting or either programs, not setting the world on fire with the ratings either, but at least it's, they're trying to do something to get out of that goofy funk that they were in the last, little while with Vince as so yeah I don't <laughs> I don't see a lot of the guys wanting the old guys that made a ton of money with Vince and worked with him when he you know before he lost his mind apparently they love him and they take up for him but I think the guys that were there and having to buck up under all that stuff I think they've so no, I think Vince for PR, for creative, and potentially just for hiring, he needs to uh, he needs to be separated from that situation. But it's his. How can you separate him if you don't want to be separated? I said a couple months ago, maybe it was by now, that he is the kind of guy that that he said as Triple H said to him. It's yours now. You're picking the, the flavor of ice cream, so I'm not going to interfere. Well, that's best for business, and that's an opinion that Vince will have until he changes his mind and thinks that, well, maybe, God damn it, it might be better if I did something else or came back or whatever. And then that might be tough to talk him out of. If you're Triple H right now, let alone Stephanie and Nick Khan, what are you thinking? Reading this, knowing it's in print, knowing you're trying to change the the feel of the company right now, and all of a sudden that's out there, not only that there's more Vince stuff, but that he's plotting to come back. And by the way, he can, anytime he wants. What do you think? I mean, how do you, you know, we talked about a week ago, was Vince being gone the best thing to happen to AEW? And we have seen things that are helping WWE right after this period of time. 
It or, turns, no, and, and you misphrased that. Hold on before anybody jumps on you. I'll edit you. You said we asked if Vince, you said was if Vince leaving was the best thing day or was the worst thing for AEW. Vince leaving was the worst thing, worst for, thing AEW. for AEW. Excuse me. Yes. 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 But that, and like you said, that opened the floodgates for people to want to go back and maybe not put all their stock in signing up with AEW just to be away from Vince, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, you've got to think that now they're going, oh, Pop, oh, Dad, oh, Vince, oh, whatever. We're, you know, they are, they are unfortunately for the WWE and fortunately for Tony Khan, every time Tony fucks up, something will happen on the other side where they will fuck up and, and throw the balance off again. I've been saying this for Months and months, maybe over a year now, nobody wants to win this promotional war. And every time that AEW has some chaos or scandal or stupid going on, you think, well, this this will be the big chance on the other side, and they come up with stupid or scandal or chaos going on. And the audience keeps shrinking for both. You have to imagine, too, and again, I don't think Vince should be back. But if you're Vince and on a Monday night you're watching your former show and you see Gargano all over that show, I know how I feel. I, Can you imagine what Vince okay. feels? Remember, that's the thing that I said probably got NXT in trouble to begin with and, and begat NXT 2.0 was Vince walked in there and saw Johnny Gargano. And right, wrong, good, bad, or indifferent, as Mama Cornette would say, whether you like him or whether you don't, that's not even in debate now. We're talking about what Vince McMahon would have thought of him. And not much would be the answer. And so, yeah, a lot of that is going to come into play because I'm thinking that Vince thought, well, yeah, Triple H and stuff, they've got it. They'll take, you know, they'll take good care of it. Wait, what, what the hell is that, pal? And let's face it, it's not like, as we've said... He's going to try to take it private. He's going to try to buy it back. Well, it's it's not like that he's been doing Eddie Graham-like work or Bill Watts-like work, Vince himself, over the last couple of years or ever, but especially over the last few years with creative. But at the same time, you know, for 40 years, he was the guy and he made a lot of people a lot of money and he had a lot of successes and he can crow about that. So if he all of a sudden now sees what Raw did 1.5 million last week or whatever it was, not even that, then that's, you know, my God, that's what a B show or a secondary cable show would have done 20 years ago that he's still thinking, well, look what I did. Well, we'll see what happens with Vince, but I guess to sum it up and to finish and go full circle here, are rumors of Vince returning the best thing that could happen to AEW? Well, let's not let's not jump into that with both feet because if this is the comment and a few months goes by and you don't hear anything else, then no, this probably would it was probably Vince, you know, telling people, yeah, yeah, why I oughta. But if it gets prevalent or he starts saying it in multiple places or to different people or it gets quoted or whatever, then yes, that might be a boon to Tony on the other side of the fence because then he can start telling either guys he might want or guys he might that might want to leave well you don't know what you're getting into over there he can come back any day so you know if it if it looks like it's more than just somebody said that or Vince made a comment one day when he was frustrated or whatever then it might turn out to be good but I don't think it's just right now, everybody's going to start running the other direction. Pretty soon, it's going to look like a tennis match <laughs> where the the fucking fans are sitting in the arena trying to follow which way the wrestlers are running to safety at back and forth and back and forth. He's here. He's there. He's here. He's there. Here's another way to look at it. If Vince McMahon lives to be 95, this is going to keep happening for like another 15 years <laughs> of him trying to gain back control of his company. This isn't yeah. going to go away. He's only going to get crazier. And remember, wasn't his mother 100? That's right. 
so yes, I th- I mean in, until such time that he could not function and be ambulatory, this this may w- very well come up from time to time because like I said, it he never intended to stop working ever. Well, Jim, if Vince is indeed planning a comeback, do you think now's the time to get off the turkey and get on the cow? Well, I don't know. It sounds like a lot of bull to me, but I'll tell you what. um, With that transition, I'll do something. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're riding a turkey or a chicken or a cow or a horse. What it matters is what you put down your throat in the holidays. I'm talking about fine quality meat byproducts courtesy of our friends at Omaha Steaks. Folks, again, you want to be a a hero to the family around holiday time. The smell of sizzling cattle in the air. And Omaha Steaks is going to help you out with that, especially with the incredible deal they've got going on right now at omahasteaks.com. 50% off site-wide, half off meat. Where are you going to hear that again? I don't think anywhere. Half off meat. Plus, when you go to omahasteaks.com, you can use the code JCE at checkout and get an additional $40 off of your order. They've got everything you need. An assortment of mouthwatering favorites, the delicious butcher's cut filet mignon, the sirloins, which, by the way, Stace and I had fillets and sirloins the other night i couldn't decide so we just had both actually i had both i gave her what was left over they got the air chilled boneless chicken the ultra juicy burgers easy to prepare comfort meals they're so comfortable you put them in the oven you heat them up and then you lay down in them and it's so comfortable it's nice and warm especially in in the winter time when the snow and the winds are whipping outside and the wolf is at the door. They don't sell wolf, though. It's illegal to eat wolf. That's why they don't do it in Omaha. But nevertheless, go to omahasteaks.com right now. Use the promo code JCE. Minimum order may be required on the 50% off site wide. Well, why wouldn't you order the maximum? And use that promo code JCE, an extra $40 off. All of this find you, it will move you to get more of this beautiful beef. It's utterly fantastic. <laughs> you know, I thought the other one was the close, and then you came back with a better one. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to give you options. You have a third? Do I have a third? What are you trying to are you trying to milk this bit for there you go. all that you can get out of it? Omaha Steaks. Dot com. A fine steak indeed, and let's talk about some fine wrestling questions from the wrestling public who listen to this fine wrestling podcast each and every week, Jim. Well, wait a minute. While a you're of... being all fine over there, and by the way, Omaha Steaks, they'll never steer you wrong, but... Another one. We've got breaking news here. I just mentioned a little while ago our friends over at Inside the Ropes and ITRWrestling.com, which is a, a related enterprise to inside the ropes magazine is now reporting mandy rose has been released by the wwe just 24 hours after losing the prestigious nxt women's championship to roxanne perez roxanne you don't have to put on the belt now um no she does she's the champion she well i guess she does yeah well then she don't have to put on the red light but i looked in the uh the wrestling news stuff here mandy rose the champion for 414 days how about that and loses the belt on tuesday night gets fired on wednesday morning apparently the article goes on to say rose's shock exit is reportedly tied to content she was posting on her brand army page how did what is Brand Army, is that like OnlyFans? I don't know. Sounds like. A a report from Fightful Select notes that WWE felt that the content she was posting was outside the parameters of her WWE deal. This comes just days after racy photos of the star were leaked online. So she's been running races also? Wait a minute, here's a quote from Fightful Select, whoever they may be. 
Fightful Select has learned that Mandy Rose has been released by WWE. WWE officials felt they were put in a tough position based on the content she was posting on her brand army page. What was she putting out there? I got to see this now. I don't know if they were in a tough position. I wonder what kind of position she was in. (laughs) They felt like it was outside of the parameters of her WWE deal. Parameters. She's going outside the parameters. Oh, no. I think think you have to pay extra for that, even on OnlyFans, when they go outside the parameters. (laughs) But this, how did we not see any of these photos or hear about this news? Because she's on NXT. (laughs) So no one gives a shit. (laughs) Maybe that's why she's posting the candid photography on on her uh, Brandy Brand Army page. Mandy Brandy. Well, I guess this officially ends the era of Otis and Mandy. Aww. They never get, did get together, those two crazy kids, the star-crossed lovers. So, I mean, I know if, I, you can make a lot of money on the online business also of that description, but it would seem like that, that they talked a while back about taking over everybody's third-party shit when they, were, when they were playing video games with fans on Twitch or whatever it was. I would think that if they, you know, that, that w- if they were upset about people playing video games on Twitch, they might be able, upset about people twitching on some other kind of fucking online thing while they're PG rated or whatever. We don't know what the young lady's been doing. She looks like a wholesome girl. I'm sure she was brought up in a good Christian home, but those parameters, they're hard to fucking, hard to beat. Hey, Trips, we got a problem. What's going on? Mandy Rose is nude on the internet. Oh, (laughs) that's outside the parameters. (laughs) Why didn't I hear about this? How do I log on to that link? She been talking to Vince? Well, Well, hey, does she look like somebody that would leak? Mandy Rose? Is she a leaker? I guess we need to go to Brand Army to find out. <laughs> see. see, I'm just, I kid, I just joke. But maybe she's got something to leak. Or or all right, all, maybe she's got something to spill. All perverted kidding aside, from what you've seen of Mandy Rose, and they tried to revamp her and Apparently give her some. Apparently I haven't seen enough. I was never interested until now. Oh boy. But what, for what, how do I say this so you can't hit me with something like this? From what you gather, mm-hmm. based on anything on television, on national cable that you have witnessed in the past with Mandy Rose, is she someone that AEW should look at for their women's division? Well, good Lord. I mean, how low can the bar be? We're talking about the division that brought us Big Swole, Athena, and Riho. So, I mean, if this girl can get in the ring without falling down, yes. And I believe she can. I don't I don't think we've seen her completely just trip over the ropes getting in the ring. Hey, uh, an article just went up on Forbes by Alfred Kanua. Man- Him again? Mandy Rose reportedly released amid nude photo and video leaks, and I was scrolling through this just to get more information. And, and Yeah, this- just, to, just merely to do your research that's the only reason you were well they're not going to have nude photos of her in forbes so that's exactly why i was scrolling through this and listen to this rose's situation transcends the third party deal conversation however given the racy nature of what were supposed to be private photos for pay so it's not just there's photos of me i'm putting out there someone's specifically requesting i want photos of nips and she's selling them. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is there a quote in Forbes with the word nips? No, and I'm trying to find a way to say this. this. For instance. Someone's saying, I want to see some skin, and she's saying, okay, here's how okay, much Okay, well, costs. you could have said skin without saying nips. Okay, well, you leave me alone. That's just, that's just low class and, and rude. So, basically, what you're saying is she's been clapping her clam on the internet, and now... I didn't say that. Somebody is upset about that. it because, <laughs> but it was a, it was a, pr- a private transaction. She wasn't just posted here. This is free. 
You can look at the goddamn Lincoln Tunnel absolutely free. What she was doing was she was making a business arrangement with specific people. Hey, this is just for you. And then they, of course, went back on that deal, apparently, and just leaked all this stuff. But let's look at this. It's dripping everywhere. Now. Will you stop? Let's try to look at this in an honest way and have an honest conversation about it. If you're WWE, if you're Jim Cornette Enterprises, whatever it may be, what do you see as being okay for third-party deals? If someone wants to play a video game on Twitch, should that be considered the same thing as someone selling nude photos of themselves to creepy fans? Well, here's, in all honesty, and by the way, I'm, I'm completely pro-porn, uh, but if they're supposed to be a... They can't do Playboy anymore, right? Because they're a PG company. The sponsors, they don't want... so. I haven't seen the material, so I don't know whether it's mild to wild or anything in between. But if the executives of the company that she works for said, well, she's a featured person in NXT and she's the champion and all this stuff. But holy shit. If anybody finds, sees this she stuff and finds out. I forgot. Yes, about, yes she, they, our champion is doing this. It's the whole other yes. thing. So if, you know, that's the thing. If they say, Jesus Christ, you can't, you know, have Aunt, Aunt Fanny out there in front of God and everybody, whether it's a private or personal deal or not or whatever, if it's going to show up on the internet in some fashion, this is probably something you should have not done while representing us and we're trying to do deals with Disney. Then I, yeah, I understand that. The question becomes, which, which endeavor was she making a bigger profit at? Was she making more money, traveling all over the place, getting in a ring with people that are going to land on her uh, and landing on shit herself and getting beat up or whatever the fuck? Or is she going to make more money in, I assume, a, a less violent setting, showing off, as Aunt Lola used to say, what God give her? So if, if it's anywhere close, maybe that's the uh, the preferable fucking direction there but i i would think i would i would understand why you can't do both if you're playing video games with wrestling fans and making money at it that's one thing unless you're while you're sitting there playing video games you go yeah i hate the fucking wwe i can't wait till i get out of it well then that's another thing but but no not if you're you know you know fiddling with the little man in the boat on the fucking movie screen for everybody to see We'll let everyone know what else happens. We'll stay on top of this Mandy Rose situation. Let's move we'll stay as we'll stay as tightly on top of her as we possibly can, and bring you all the news as soon as it erupts. Jim, more WWE news this week. Apparently, Matt Riddle failed a second drug test, and he has been sent to rehab. Uh. He has been written off TV for what I've seen as at least six weeks. They say he ought to go to rehab. He said, bro, bro, bro. That's horrible. Here, now this is, I got. I feel sorry for this guy and I don't even like him. And I've never met him in person. I just, I don't like his wrestling or the way he looks or dresses or acts or speaks or breathes or anything else. But, you know, but I got nothing against him. But here's the thing. They've got a guy on the fucking card whose entire gimmick and personality that they write for is that he's on drugs. And then they threaten to fire him and make him go to rehab when they find out he's on drugs. Does that make, hey, bro, you want to hit my bong go? That's it. That's just, so wh where is the surprise here? Wouldn't they have been more surprised if they tested him and found out he wasn't on drugs? I, 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 well, I think there's different. We're sending mixed messages. There are different drugs. I think that they're okay now, WWE, no with marijuana, seemingly. But cocaine and ecstasy, for instance, may be a different story. Well, now that's been leaked. See all these leaks and, and drips and trickles. And then trickles, when they trickle down, then they drip. Uh, yeah, I, Honestly, I don't know with this guy whether anybody could tell if he was on cocaine and, and ecstasy as well. 
But again, you're sending mixed messages. Either approve of the guy being on drugs on your television program as long as he's, what is he's only faking being on drugs? Or when you find out that the guy that you tell to go out and act like he's on drugs on your television program is on drugs, you really can't goddamn say anything. That's my belief. What do you believe? Uh, about what? I I believe Matt Riddle apparently is in treatment right now. We hope for the best. Uh, yeah, we hope for the best for Matt because he got he got jacked around. See, he was just doing research for his role. He's a he's a method actor. Well, no you one said like anything all, about like meth. No one said anything about meth. No method. Oh. Method. He's a method. He's a method actor. You see, he he goes to the to the Stanislavski method. Oh. See. Strasburg. He was researching his part. He wanted to make sure that he was playing this as credibly and believably to the best of his ability. So he wanted to research all these various drugs so he'd know which ones that he needed to act like he was on and which ones he didn't need to act like he was on. I've never seen much of the cocaine, but I have seen the, at least the marijuana and the ecstasy, along with the just lack of brain cells. Where have you seen the ecstasy? Well, he's always smiling. Oh, you mean on him? I thought you meant like, yeah. I've walked into a room, I've never seen the cocaine, but I've seen the marijuana and the ecstasy. No, no, that's another line completely. I've never seen her wrestle, but I have seen her box. But we're not talking about that now. No, I'm talking about on him. He doesn't, he doesn't ever seem real hyper. He always seems more laid back, like he's going in that direction. Do you think the ecstasy explains the birds? That fly out of his ass? Yeah. I don't know, but they it had to be some high price shit, because remember Halloween, they turned into pumpkins. One time they were giraffes. When you're just not only producing farm animals and wildlife out of your anal sphincter, but also different kinds at different holiday seasons, you've, you've got a serious drug problem. Does this change the way you use him when he comes out of rehab if you're WWE? And I asked that about Riddle specifically or about anybody who's oh, upper mid-card top star. Well, this does present an interesting conundrum for him, doesn't it? Because now, if the guy comes out and makes these stupid, childish, adolescent jokes that nobody over the age of 13 would get a giggle out of to begin with uh, about his marijuana smoking or whatever the fuck they've got him doing after he's just come out of rehab, well, doesn't that leave a bad taste in people's mouth? Is that like... Would that have been like if Moxley came out of rehab and then they had him come out and act like he's drunk? So, and since that's, I mean, we got a Mark Marrow situation here too because the only thing that Matt Riddle's ever done is be stoner Matt Riddle bro. So if you take that away, is he going to go to college and suddenly start speaking like fucking Keith Lee or Fraser Crane and using big multisyllabic terms? Or are they going to have him go back and do the same thing? But just only do the drugs that we write in the script for you to do. Do not do the other drugs. See, this is a very sticky situation here. No, but all kidding aside, WWE uses him pretty well. Obviously, they like his material because they've fed into it. And in the last year, there was that one scandal where he was accused, I believe, of rape by his mistress which blew up his marriage now wait now wait a minute now wait a minute no his 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 unauthorized girlfriend outside of marriage mistress could have all kinds of connotations we don't know what she was doing with him or to him or whatever well they claimed that they were in a she claimed and i don't think he disagreed that they were in a relationship together that's why i said mistress. yeah but well but she didn't have handcuffs and fucking leg irons on him and wasn't whacking him with a fucking riding crop so i didn't mean <laughs> I didn't mean mistress of the club. I meant mistress, an actual mis Mist in mistress the traditional of the dark? sense. Elvira, Elvira. I meant a traditional mistress. <laughs> and Trud I said traditional. Out. Well, we want these traditional family values to be on the program. This is a very serious topic. Matt Riddle. It certainly is. Matt Riddle has already had that. Now he's been popped for what we're going to assume is not marijuana. So a lot of people are saying a lot of different things. At a certain point with someone like that, and you could put any wrestler in that position, when you have these things happening, and it seems like there's always some kind of drama, 
what does that do to you as a company in terms of your future preparations and what you want to do with someone? It is, you know, because I mean, we've all seen Jeff Hardy. I guess that's the biggest long term example we have now, right? Well, yes, but it, there's a whole lot of space between Riddle and Jeff at this point still. You know, they could, because I don't think you can, if this is the second time he's flunked a test, it's the second time he's ever flunked a test because he's never worked anywhere else. And, you know, Jeff's issues, and thankfully he's getting those addressed. And from what we can tell from anything Matt has said, everything's going smoothly. But that was over a longer period of time of years and in multiple companies that there were issues. So does the guy have an issue uh, that is a problem that needs to be addressed or is the guy just goofy and just goes out and does shit like his apparently, you know, fairly true to life gimmick indicates? Does he just go out and do shit without thinking about it ahead of time? Or, hey, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Who knows? But I think that you've got to you got to take into account the totality of working with a guy. They've been around him for several years on a regular basis. I'm talking about the WWE office, and they know probably kind of what they've got there and and who he is. And if it you know it, they let him get by with well, not let him get by with, but they they did not take action on the accusation because apparently there were other people in the van. I guess they talked to people, whatever the case, it didn't seem like that they felt they needed to do, to do anything there. But with this, if it's the second time, then they, you know, they have probably forced this issue because the third strike you're out, no matter who you are, at least if people find out about it, I guess. and they don't want to get rid of him or they don't want him to, you know, fuck up and them have to get rid of him. So maybe they've done this now because they still want to keep him. They want to use him. He, he probably would fit right in with that bowl of fucking mixed nuts over an AEW. Uh, so they probably want to keep him, don't want to get rid of him, but they know they'll have to, if it happens again. And I would imagine he would be on, some kind of double secret probation for a little while after this, but I, I don't, we don't want to act like all of a sudden, oh my God, here's another Jeff Hardy when Jeff was having his issues for a, a long period of time in multiple places. I guess a big overall question because a lot of people have been wondering about the current state of the WWE wellness system. And since day one, a lot of people have questioned if there was an AEW wellness system. Should wrestling companies test for all these drugs? Do you think that's inside the purview of what a wrestling promotion or a promoter should do? Or what are your thoughts on that? It was, it was necessary at one time, I think, because it became necessary. Because, and especially, I'm not talking about guys in independence because they can do what they, you know, they can do what they want, right? Good or bad, they're adults and they're independent contractors. In the WWF, later WWE, as we've talked about, those guys are independent contractors in classification only. They tell you what to do, where to go, et cetera, et cetera. But because so many of the guys were developing issues and problems, there had to be something done. There had to be some testing. And for a while, at least while I was there in the 90s, they appeared to be somewhat serious. They even tested me when I came in. Just managing, you know, Yoko for TVs. Oh, you got to do so. I take the thing and go in the bathroom. The guy's following me. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I've got to watch you. Now, that was a new one on me. I'd had a few drug tests in different places, but the, to act, I said, I don't know you. And unless you're a sexy girl that's going to do a variety of ad attractive things, I'm probably not going to let you watch me piss, pal. And and so they well you got to do it as well I don't really have to goddamn do it and Jerry Briscoe said here come here come in here with me and he fucking went in the bathroom with me he said I'm a official or whatever the fuck and he stood outside the stall and whistled but you know the, the guys that had problems and in the WWE and in WCW at that time 
you know, when they were during the Attitude Era, when they were actually making money and, and guys had issues. And I, I mean, you can go down into further company should AEW well, a lot of those guys do work independence but the, for the money that he's paying he should have the i think the privilege of knowing whether anybody's fucked up or not especially if there's reason if there's cause if there's reason to believe it because once a lot of companies establish programs and and sooner or later it's expensive and you're finding that most people ain't flunking, then it starts becoming a cost issue, and then they start doing it on cause if somebody suspects something or whatever. So, I mean, you know, yes, I think the WWE has a right to, because as much as they got a right to tell any of the other, uh, tell the other guys or tell the guys any of the other things they tell them. And if you're working for a company full time and there's big money involved, if it's a goddamn $150 independent shot, you know, not only can the promoters not afford it, but then the guys will go, well, fuck you. I'll just work for any of these other fucking clowns. I, so there, there has to be a cutoff point. But do the guys, do most of the wrestlers take drugs anymore? Or do they all play video games and watch Japanese tapes? There are still plenty of wrestlers with pill problems. There are still plenty of wrestlers doing plenty of drugs. It doesn't go away. Well, good. It's good to know that at least some things never change. <laughs> no. And, th and that's, that's the biggest thing that ought to be looked for, I would think, honestly, is prescription medication painkillers in specific, because that's the, the issue now. I think that if anybody in the wrestling business has one, that's where it starts. Jim, scrolling through Twitter right now, based on what your live update was earlier, I have to say a lot of fans are livid about Mandy Rose being released. <laughs> they think it's a double standard from WWE. A lot of people feel that it's unfair that she's been released for these photos when they've had people pose for Playboy in the past. A lot of people think it's misogynist. Well, and, and again, during the Attitude Era, they, girls, they were, the guys were encouraging the girls in the crowd to flash their tits. So how could they not have people in Playboy? And plus, when they got people in Playboy, whether it was Sable or then China or whoever the fuck's done it since then, it was big sales and big publicity. And uh, that meant something for business. But then when they determined that they needed to be PG, family-oriented, for the wider sponsorships they could get or the networks or whatever the fuck then they couldn't do that anymore so it's not a double standard if you did if a company did something 20 years ago and then has changed their method of operation to the point where they can't do that thing anymore it's not a double standard it's only a double standard if somebody is being allowed to do something right now in this current environment that somebody else in their same position is not being allowed to do then you can kind of get cranky about it well, perhaps if uh, I'm not going to transition there and I'm not going to do that one. So we'll get another question in and then I'll <laughs> go to the transition. Jim, a lot of people have been asking questions still. It's been a popular topic for weeks now about William Regal. A report came out this week and I believe I have an article here from PW Insider, Mike Johnson. WWE sources have confirmed William Regal has officially come to terms on his new position within the company and will start the first week of January, we are told Regal will have a vice president position in the company when he returns, but we have not heard what his official title or role will be. William Regal returning as vice president, undefined role. What are your thoughts? Um. Well, and obviously, that's what they wanted him for. They didn't want him to come back and be a manager on television or, you know, specifically be the general manager, authority figure, whatever, of NXT. A lot of people were talking about that. That's something he's done before, but that was a an extension of the jobs and responsibilities he had. You knew that Triple H has always been close to Regal. Regal helped him when uh, Triple H first was starting in WCW and Regal had first got there, but he'd still been in the business a while. He's 
as we've talked about, a great guy to listen to if you want to train or if you want to know psychology or just the, you know, the ins and outs of the actual physical aspect of wrestling, all those things. And so, yes, I'm sure Triple H wants him for some type of vice president of developmental or of training or scouting or talent acquisition or, you know, jerking a knot in talent's tail or whatever they come up with. That's what he's going to be doing. And I saw people say, well, apparently now the story is that there's a, there, there was a, a, a clause in whatever out Tony Khan gave, gave him to get out early that he couldn't be on camera for the WWE and, and people were going, well, how dare Tony do that? I thought he was going to be different. Well, that would be a smart thing if he did do that, if he inserted that, that, well, at least he can't leave my TV and go right back to their TV. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but that was something that was reported and that I would agree with Tony on. But the point is, WWE had no problem in agreeing to that or would have had no problem because that's not primarily what they want him for. He's important behind the scenes at his age with his experience and with the respect and goodwill he has for most of the people in the business. I'm sure there were people in AEW that wouldn't even listen to William Regal for fuck's sake because they know it all. But the respect and everything he has for most people, that's where he's most valuable in that company moving forward is they can get another, even at his age, at 10 years or however long that he wants to stay involved of his knowledge and experience in building and developing new talent. And that's what he's going to be doing. I would certainly almost bet my house on it. And again, no problem with Tony insisting on one year off TV. That's the smart thing to do. Well, yes, because again, it wasn't going to stop the deal. Like I said, because obviously they want Regal for more than just to be on camera, but at least it, and all the smart fans are going to go, well, we all know, you know, that he's going anyway. Well, yeah, but they don't need to, number one, beat you over the head with it by put, sticking him on TV the week after he gets there. And secondly, as we've found out with even the amount of attention that the CM Punk Media scrum, all out, fall out, EVPs suspended the whole nine yards, all the attention that got on the internet from reports that we had from the buildings, there were still just the fans that go buy a ticket, go see the live show, watch it on TV every so often, whatever, that were like, where are all these guys? What happened? They didn't know. There's plenty of people that watch NXT that don't watch AEW, just like even Uncle Dave reports the statistics on the pay-per-views. There's people who order the WWE pay-per-views that don't order the AEWs and vice versa. And there's some people that order the AEW pay-per-views that don't order the Ring of Honor or vice versa, whatever. So you can't just assume everybody knows everything. And if Regal showed up on Raw or SmackDown or NXT or whatever after this bizarre exit from AEW that would kind of rub a little sodium into the wounds. But I'll tell you again, nobody, John Barrymore at the Palladium didn't have the number of fucking curtain calls that William Regal had to get him out of that company. He, he walked out, he was carried out, and then he spoke from beyond the grave. It was like they were one of those created adventure books where you get to choose the ending based on which fucking path you want to take. You know, just to go back to that, you know, the MJF hitting him with the brass knuckles, that was the perfect final goodbye. Once we got to that point, okay, let it play out. Him coming back after that defeats the whole purpose of that being the last image you have of William Regal on TV there, which helps the world champion. Oh, but, but cleverly, it was taped two weeks beforehand, see, and, and, and Shivani, boy, you can, you can trust Tony Shivani with government secrets. Cause he didn't, <laughs> wasn't he just yelling about William Regal being a scumbag for turning on Moxley to go with MJF? He already knew, yes, if he knew right. about this. Why was he yelling about that? And he was also yelling at MJF for being a scumbag when he turned blah, 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 blah. But the uh, point is, 
with that, yes, it it should have been the the out, and MJF should have explained what needed to be explained. But it, but instead, you know, because I guess seventeen people probably had a hand in that, trying to figure out how to get rid of him. Well, Jim, we've spoken a lot about William Regal here on the show recently. It's been a popular topic. He has finally made a comment on Twitter a couple of days ago. Let me read this to you, get your thoughts. There seems to be a lot of news about me getting spread around. There's enough people who really know me, although they are few, as trust is a big issue with me, who know the truth. Unless you hear it from me directly, it is at best secondhand information. Unless you hear it directly from me, all in caps, it is either wrong or someone's interpretation of what is really going on. And that means everything, in caps, that is being said about me from every source, in quotes. That's escalated over that tweet. That goes for anyone saying, and that's all in caps, they have spoken or know me. A still tongue keeps a wise head. Yeah, well, the source for our information was Tony at that press conference. Yeah, that's kind of where we, <laughs> where we got that from. Of course, we had been mentioning that he was going back for some time, and, and wouldn't you know who won the pony? And that's what happened, of course. That's what happened. We didn't say we heard it from William Regal. And, you know, I know William Regal, but I haven't spoken to him about this, and that's why I never said I did. I think he's talking about some of these other people with the lack of journalistic integrity that you and I possess. I will confirm that William Regal is not my source for William Regal news. I I concur and I do the same, but we still seem to be getting it mostly right. Well, another, just to get off the uh, William Regal topic here, this is something else that a lot of people have found interesting. He recently, apparently in October, spoke at an ITR Inside the Ropes live event, I'm assuming in the UK. With our our good friend Kenny McIntosh. He's everywhere. Check your home movies, folks. Kenny's going to be in the flick. Well, here's a quote from William Regal. Mr. McMahon was very good to me, to the point of, I will say this because whatever he's going through, he was excellent to me. I had a talent contract as well as an employee contract. And it didn't run out until the end of April because I played William Regal. I started for AEW on the 7th of March. I didn't call anybody else. I sent a message straight to the boss. Hey, boss, I've got this thing with Brian, being Brian Danielson. And he loves Brian as well. Absolutely, you go. And still paid me until the end of my talent contract. I was the only person who ever got paid by both companies at the same time. Now, you know a little bit about this because you talked about the different contracts from when you were there. Yes. What are your thoughts on the idea he was being paid by both companies and that Vince said, yeah, that's fine, go there? Well, but now let's back up for a second because Vince is the one that gave him notice, right? Regal didn't quit. And and he was let go, he was released, and that was while Vince was still in charge, correct? That is what we had heard. So, it is technically possible, and it's not the the only time it's ever happened in this respect for someone to have an employee contract and a talent contract, or a... When I was there, and I've told this story, I'm not going to do it again, but they couldn't make you an employee if you were still going to be taking bumps and being physically active. But since Regal has had health issues and he was not being asked to be physically active, it's not unheard of for someone to have an employee contract but also have a talent contract. And remember, like I think Triple S, Stephanie's been in that place and Triple H has been in that place where they're executives but they still have a talent contract which is separate and pays them to appear on television as a character rather than working in the company so Regal could have had that and it is not unusual for those contracts to end at different times because they might be signed at different times 
he might have become an employee after he already had an existing talent contract and they would renew you know each contract as they come up rather than doing it in a lump so but he's right as far as i would know as far as i can figure Nobody has ever actually, there's always, if you've got a non-compete, you're paid through your non-compete and then you can start after that, but you're not getting paid anymore. Or in some cases, somebody might be paid severance pay to leave, boom, but then you're not actively being paid when you go somewhere else. But nobody, to my knowledge, has ever gotten a check from both companies at the same time, which is a pretty neat trick. But a lot of people are going to say, well, how has that never happened before? Why did it happen here? Whatever reason that Vince had in his mind, or if he wasn't the one that did it, whoever was doing it on his behalf that gave Regal his release to begin with, I don't have any idea why that would have taken place. So therefore, Vince probably said, you know what, this guy's been here how many years, his employee deals up anyway, we've released him, but his Talent contract runs another couple months, and he's hit me with it, which Regal, again, learned to work in the carnivals, and he's hit Vince with a story, I want to go with my boy Brian, and he hits Tony with a story, I want to go with my son. My son's in AEW. I mean, Brian's in yes, AEW. Yes, Brian, whatever, but... This worked. I got to use this one again. Yeah, I'll put that one down in the book. But So Vince probably said, yeah, just pay him a couple more months on it. Pay him out on his talent contract. I can see him doing that. And I can see him saying, yeah, you know, we don't have anything for you. Go, go do your thing over there. Vince would have no, you know, if a wrestler in Vince's mind is trying to dick him around or get one over on him, he will, he'll extend a contract or freeze a contract or enforce or do whatever the fuck. But once he's decided that he's, he's got the last word, he's released him or it doesn't need him or you know, I like the guy, but, you know, it's just business, pal. But, ah, you go do your thing. And, I mean, that that's extended back in the old days to when he would give guys that had already left an extra big payoff just so they wouldn't be able to say, I fucked them on the way out, pal. He does shit like that. So I can believe that. Would you believe that? Would you believe? That's another awkward transition spot here. Would you believe that, uh... I would believe that you need to get back on some drugs, Matt Riddle, if you're not already, or whatever the fuck is hampering your formulas, your formulating of a cogent simile here today on the program. All right, well, there are two options to transition to from Regal being paid by Vince. One is ExpressVPN. Mm hmm. And I'm going to go with that one. Because okay. Because I'm assuming. That if Vince wanted to watch an AEW pay-per-view illegally, he would probably... I shouldn't use that example. I'm assuming that if Vince McMahon wanted to look at some... I'm Illegal assuming, paralegals? I'm assuming that if Vince McMahon wanted to watch the WWE Network, but he lived in the United States and he couldn't, he would probably want to find a way, and he could with ExpressVPN. Just, just move over and get the fuck out of the way. Folks, have you been naughty or nice this year? Well, I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter because you might be able to fool Santa, but you can't fool your internet provider, those IPs. You know, they know everything about you. They've seen all your late night naughty searches. They know they read your documents as they come through the flying inner interweb machine. And then there's people inside your walls holding up drinking glasses so they can hear every word or exclamation that you emit. And that's what's going on in your house, folks. They're all over the place. They're in the walls. They're keeping an eye on you when you leave. You know that brown Ford LTD with Missouri plates following you around shopping, gas station, school? That's your internet service providers. They're keeping an eye on you. But fortunately... That may be someone else. Call the police. Well, either we call the police on the, the internet service providers, especially if you got Spectrum, because they're criminals anyway, stealing my money, not giving me my goddamn service I pay for. But nevertheless, AT&T, Verizon, 
They can see all the websites that you've clicked on. They know how much time you've spent on each one of them. And if it's less than 75 or 80 seconds, they know what you're doing there. And they have likely sold it to advertisers or your family or friends or people that will blackmail you because that's what these kind of people do. But with ExpressVPN, they're not going to allow that to happen because ExpressVPN gets all your traffic and reroutes it, puts up the big orange cones and the big barrels and the big flashing signs and reroutes it through an encrypted server that is so convoluted and so impossible to navigate and so incredibly intricate. It's almost a Gordian knot of a route that will send your signal all the way from your internet, your computer right there, through the walls and through the skies and through the seas and around the world, and finally coming to rest at DumboDoesItDonkeyStyle.com, where nobody can follow you there. And then you can see all those movies and find out that you don't see everything about animal husbandry when you go to Tijuana. Folks, ExpressVPN's app works on all of your devices. It works on your laptop. It works on your iPad. It works on your phone. It works on the Didolator Mach 3. So whatever you're on, you're protected. As a matter of fact, every once in a while, you might be asked to put a condom on your cell phone, but only in certain neighborhoods. And best of all, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button to turn it on. Boy, don't you wish your girlfriend was like that. And you're instantly protected. So take yourself off the naughty list and don't let everybody know what you're doing late at night, especially, I'm telling you again, these internet service providers, they'll make sure that your mother-in-law knows and you know what a bitch she can be. So. Go to expressvpn.com slash J-C-E, express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash J-C-E, and you're going to get three extra months of protection for free. Feel safe and feel secure. And don't be like Mandy Rose and get outed on the internet and get fired from your job. Keep all the strange, deviant behavior that you exhibit in your own home where it should be, expressvpn.com slash JCE. That's right, Jim, ExpressVPN, and I'm not sure if it was ExpressVPN or what source you used, but I got a little look at what in the early 80s would have been Jim Cornette, the bootlegger, the video trader, <laughs> when I received the link, surprisingly, with a match that I guess we had to watch one way or another. FTR versus Briscoe's three double dog collar. And they tried to hide it from us. Now they did everything they could. They waited till literally less than, what did we figure out? 66 hours before the match went in the ring to even announce it to begin with. Then they put it on the least watched pay-per-view that they will do all year because it's a Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Ring of Honor has no television. Some people are going to say it's been AEW television has been Ring of Honor TV, but in such a haphazard way. Three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. But by cracky, even though we said if Tony would have announced it in proper time that we would have actually given him our money, instead we just cut to the meat of the matter. This pay-per-view was four and a half hours long from the indication that I was given on what I watched, and it was a one-match show, let's face it. I mean, other people, there were people on there that we like, but the matchmaking was so ridiculous, and they had to shove Useless and Garcia down our throat again. But this was the match really that sold the last Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Everybody said, oh, okay, for $40 or whatever, we want to see this match. The last two Ring of Honor pay-per-views. The last two Ring of Honor pay-per-views. I forgot, last year's final battle and then last year's whatever the fuck it was they were on. No, I think final battle last year was when they first attacked the Briscoes, but then they had two other pay-per-view matches that's right, this year. That's right, that's right. Nevertheless, the point is they have yet to have one on an AEW pay-per-view. They have yet to have the... And I'm calling bullshit at this point. 
I'm calling bullshit on their supposed reason that Mark and Jay Briscoe are not on AEW television. I think it has more to do with the jealous EVPs than with any executive. They've had convicted felons, bank robbers, people in and out of rehab on this program. And everybody's just fine. And if you want to talk about Mike Tyson was on the show, how many years was he in prison? But a mean tweet from 12 years ago. I think it was, I think it's something else from, well, you know, back when the the Buckaroos were in Ring of Honor in 2011. We had the same issue, Delirious and I. How do you book these guys against any other tag team? Can't book them against the Briscoes. That looks ridiculous. Looks like the Briscoes should be arrested for abusing children. Can't book them against Haas and Benjamin. That'd be more ridiculous. What the fuck do you do when there are two children that are visually off-putting? And the only way that they ever got over the Briscoes in Ring of Honor was by, unfortunately co-opting the whole company on this deliriousness, no pun intended, this delusional elite bullet club, we're all the next future of wrestling thing. And they got by with that just long enough to bilk a billionaire out of his money. But I digress. <clears throat> I'm officially calling bullshit that the best wrestlers and the best announcers that we see in the entire year of wrestling, none of them are featured in some can the Briscoes at all in FTR's case, prominently in Ian and Caprice's case, barely featured on the main television programming. It's like, if you, who's the best player right now for your beloved New York Mets? Depends on what you're looking at, but let's say Pete Alonzo. Okay, let's send Pete Alonzo to fucking Toledo to, to bat for the Mud Hens, and we'll bring one of the AAA guys up and put him in an old Alonzo spot. Does that make sense? It wouldn't make sense, and of course, the Mud Hens are a part of a different farm system, but yeah. Well, you get my drift. But nevertheless, so here we go. Three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon on a Ring of Honor pay-per-view for a company that no longer exists, doesn't have a television program, but they're going to have the best match that they've had uh, that's been on the air since the last time the Briscoes and FTR had a match. Again, the Briscoes have the best look of any tag team in wrestling. You instantly believe that they're who they're supposed to be. And and they make an impression. And even and the Briscoes aren't spring chickens anymore. I can't, I'm trying to think at 20 years ago, whether they're close, one of them's closing in on 40 and the other one might be 40. But they sure don't move like it. And they look even better than they did 10 years ago. Because they look meaner and dirtier and nastier. And that's an example of a tag team having a gimmick instead of playing a part or being characters. Their gimmick is them turned up. And th this match, it if it, a lot of people are going, well, Cornette, they used chairs and tables and they had blood and the chain match and everything. If you're going to do this match, this is the way to do this match. If you're going to be wild, this is the place to do it. Both teams, not only in storyline, but in reality, have something to prove. Both teams have had, they've had two matches, and both matches have been completely different. And now this is a stipulation match, and it's going to be completely different. And not only are they trying to follow it to prove something in storyline to each other that they're the baddest tag team, but they're trying to prove to everybody in their own company that they're the best. It's a follow this motherfuckers type of deal. Hey, they're saying the Midnight Express did the same thing with the Fantastics our last night in the Dallas Sportatorium. 
wasn't even a TV taping just for the people there, the goddamnest match they ever had. People were fucking screaming, we leave, and it's like, follow that, motherfuckers, we're gone. You should have paid us. Well, they're doing the same thing. Follow this, motherfuckers. Oh, but we forgot, you can't, because none of you are as good as we are. And they're trying to make a point, and they made it. If you're going to have chairs and tables and furniture and blood, this is the kind of match to have it. These are the two kind of teams to do it. There's no trampoline bullshit, no holding hands and do si doing. It looked like a fight between four guys that didn't like each other with animosity and aggression. And can you imagine if this wasn't, if it wasn't so overdone that every jack off indie match has a table stunt or chairs or blood or whatever the fuck that when two professional teams with a reason for it that can execute it when they actually do it it would mean so much more because every jack leg in town wasn't being allowed to do it so it's context presentation and performance and most people don't have it, but these guys did. And Ian and Caprice call it seriously. They're speaking to wrestling fans, but they're not being markish. They don't have the over-the-top tone or the ridiculous, incessant insistence on every Japanese move ever made being called like sock face. You understand them and you believe them. So they're not being ridiculous. FTR. They could have a wrestling match with rules and not bury the referee and do everything right. Or they can baby face and they can heal. And they can have a brawl. And it still looks good. And you still get into it. And it doesn't look hokey or phony. This is not two fat bald guys with fucking things dangling out of their ears standing there letting each other bash them over the head with a fucking fluorescent light tube it looks like a fight between four guys that chained two and two that don't like each other it didn't want to be there wanted to get finished with it and, and be done with the other guy and I believe that's why the buckaroos in their camp are so jealous of guys like this because they're not capable of doing this. They're not capable of looking like men in a fight. They're not capable of, of work good enough to make it believable that they would hurt anybody except their friends that flip and flop for them the same way. So... As far as a television product, besides the, the, this kind of match being hard to follow for the cameras, especially when there's two guys in one part of the building and two guys in the other part of the building, it's hard to follow on TV. It's better in the arena when you can see the whole scene of chaos. Otherwise than that, you know, this was an example of what you can do when you take the business seriously, you're good at it, and you can project an aura that you are serious about what you're doing instead of just jacking around. And Moxley and Jericho could learn from all of these guys sleight of hand, I'll tell you that. It didn't get old. It it didn't it wasn't like, oh my god, we're seeing this again and again and again just repetition and blah. They exchanged advantages at different points but it still it kept it fresh and uh, again when when dax accidentally nailed posey the referee mike posey and busted him open then not only people are, oh but caprice and ian went to the golf commentary the hush like oh shit this is serious it whereas sock face would have been screaming oh my god he's bleeding eh. And they worked with the chains. The chains sometimes didn't work with them. But they worked the chain gimmick. And the chains were important parts of various things throughout the match. Hey, I'm 
trying to think off the top of my head, how many times were you actually involved with a chain during a match? Oh, I don't think the Midnight ever had one. That's what I'm trying to think of. I can't think of a single example. And double uh, the uh, the Gangsters. I booked one one time. The Gangsters against Tracy Smothers and Tony Anthony. I believe it was. And it, you know, it they're hard because you have to keep going, but you can't step on the other guy's spots and et cetera, et cetera. But there haven't been that many double chain matches, so they didn't have. You know, you can you can research uh, the strap matches and the chain matches, the singles, Wahoo strap matches or Malenko's chain matches or Ron Ray. Well, there's not a lot of Ron Wrights around on film, but but you have to be really creative to do it in a tag team environment. And, you know, especially at the point in time where, you know, one guy needs help, but his partner can't get to him because the other guy's sitting down on the chain and he can't get to him. Shit like that. And <laughs> poor Dax tried to do that diving headbutt with chain wrapped around his head. At one point he could, he was bleeding so bad. He couldn't get the chain to quit slipping off his head. You could see him say, fuck it. He just held it on and went with it anyway. Still looked good. You know, but that's the, that's the thing. And, and all these guys are tough, but again, the Briscoes have been taking bumps like this for 20 years. They are the toughest guys in the business. I'm not talking about collegiate shooters. I'm talking about you apparently don't want to fuck with the Briscoes because they don't sell pain and injury very well. And there were there were few false finishes, but they got them when they did them. When Jay hit that Jay driller on Dax and got a two count, it was a huge pop. And they're all, they're selling the effects of what's going on. And Ian Riccoboni asked, what, what about these guys' wives and kids? I mean, that's, that's old fashioned wrestling commentary, not Hayabusa did this in the Tokyo Dome in 1993. It's these guys are married. They have kids that are going to be seeing this. What must go be going through their minds? Everybody can relate to something like that. It's not fucking goofy and abstract. And Dax has an incredible pile driver, and he hit it on the chair on Jay, I think it was, for a two count, but he didn't get the full cover. And I could buy that. When he, when he pile drove him, he just turned over, and his legs were covering Jay because he was so spent. And they can, and the people start chanting, "This is awesome!" And they were chanting, "This is wrestling." They know it when they see it. They just don't get to see it that often. And then the finish was simple, but it worked for this because everybody was so beaten down. Jay finally hits a superplex on Dax onto a bunch of chairs in the ring, but both of them sold. There wasn't a cover. Immediately, Mark was holding cash out on the floor with the chain, and then finally, Jay's able to cover, but enough time has, has expired. One, two, kick out, big pop. But now Jay's got Dax down, and he hogtied him with the chain around his mouth and face and stretched him. And it, Dax didn't tap, the referee called it. He was out, he was defenseless. Boom, ding, 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 new champions. And the people went crazy. And everybody, again, is talking, oh, another match of the year candidate, you think? That's what we've been screaming. I've been screaming about the Briscoes for 10 fucking years. But anyway, all serious, no bullshit, looked like a grudge match. And people respond to that. And the blood fit. And even the weapons fit, because that's the place to do it. And they didn't bury the referee with all this stuff, because not only was it an anything goes, no DQ, but it wasn't lazy booking, not the way these teams did it. But they also had two referees, who, when the one got knocked goofy and got busted open, Paul Turner could take over. It looked like they were trying to do something to control this as best as possible. The, everybody did a good job on this thing. And that's why it's so criminal that the smallest audience gets to see this. And uh, even if you say, okay, well, the Briscoes, because of this unnamed executive that's pissed off from 12 years ago, they can't be on TBS. Why can't FTR be on TBS? So we can see some of this shit 
with other teams in them. Why do we have to look at the goddamn Bermuda Triangle and the Cucamonga Kids seven weeks in a row? Because of their egos and they're jealous. This match makes people want to search out and find and pay $40 for a fucking pay-per-view. They don't give a shit about anything else on the card. But the matches they're presenting in their best of seven series make hundreds of thousands of people turn it off, and it's free. Help me, Brian, to understand this. Well, I don't think there's any understanding of the booking of FTR, and Tony can't really explain why they've been booked this way. There is no explanation for it, especially considering how in 2022 their popularity exploded, and they also had the best tag team matches anyone has seen in years. And it's not just the Briscoes. So there's no ex- explanation for any well, of that. Well, FTR and, and uh, Ozzy Oldham over there in England said uh, p- people raved about it. FTR versus anybody. They go everywhere. They win everything everywhere else. And uh, they have great matches. But the, the promotion they're signed to, they do pre-tapes with children. Oh, and then by the way, by the way, just for the finish of this, after... This incredible match to shoot an angle on a pay per view that a minute portion, less than a probably a tenth of the audience for free television is going to see after FTR puts the Briscoes over, then the gun boys come out and beat the shit out of them and cut a promo on them, and then the Briscoes chase them off. Talk about an extraneous angle that wasn't necessary and didn't need to be done in that moment, especially. They can't help themselves. I completely agree to the point where I even forgot that that happened because there was no point in it happening there. I will disagree with you on one thing, and traditionally I've liked them. I didn't like the commentary, and I think Ian does a good job, but he's got to be careful with the fake-sounding announcer voice sometimes. Because you said he said, oh, what about their wives? It's one thing saying, oh my God, what about their wives? I'm thinking, oh my God, what about their wives? What about you? You have to be careful with that. You know, I know he's a professional and he has a way of speaking, but sometimes, especially when it's a brutal match like this, I think it needs to sound a little more raw, a little less, uh, not not wrestling raw, but a little more raw as a a broadcaster, a little less polished in those moments. Well, but you know, at the same time, they were probably trying to do the same thing that the guys in the match were trying to do show hey we're over here we do a better job than everybody else and we're on the c team what about us so there could have been an element of trying a little hard there also but i like them. you know and my biggest problem with the match was probably conceptually and it took me a while to get into it we can go we can go over the fact that if you really think about it despite the fact there's been no tv no build-up no programs maybe one or two youtube videos we saw of this program there was room to do a lot because it's a one-year program. They attacked the Briscoes a year ago at Final Battle. They close out, we would think, they close out the program, at least this version of it, a year later at Final Battle. A good open, a good end, great matches in the middle, just nothing to build it up special or do good promos or anything else. And my God, as bad as they need people that can talk on that television show and the Briscoes interviews are some of the best in the business too. They could light that fucking show up and give you something to look forward to. I agree with you. But my problem was, I loved the first match. I loved the second match, two of my favorite matches of the year, easily. And the third match was great, but I said conceptually I had a problem with it. Why are they having a dog collar match? Well, we don't know. Did one of the wrestlers (laughs) try to escape one of the previous matches? No. You know, traditionally when the dog collar is used... I mean, most people go right back to Piper and Greg Valentine in 83 in mid Atlantic. But actually, they should go back to Dog and, and Hayes in 1980 because that's the gist of it, is that Dog was allegedly blind, but this way, Hayes couldn't get away from him. He couldn't get any farther than 10 feet away from Dog because they were going to be chained together. And that would, that's, so you're right. So one of, again, it, Tony Khan set it up. It's Tony Khan's booking. The teams just took it and made something out of it. Would I have have had a double dog collar match as the blow off to this, or as any part of this feud? Probably not without doing something to set up 
the dog collar match, but we we have we are working with the fact that Tony Khan's a mark and just writes down stipulations to matches without really knowing why they are supposed to come about or how they're supposed to be set up or whatever. They just say, oh, God, that'll be great. But he would put Bruiser Brody in a chain match, whatever. He swings the chains, we'll put him in a chain match, that blah, blah, blah. But when the, the wrestlers involved can take something that doesn't really make sense and still make a masterpiece out of it and then do it in three different ways over the course of the year, I like that. You know, it was a brilliant and brutal dog collar match. My issue, why it took me a little bit to get into it, was there was no reason for these guys to immediately go out there and kill each other with the dog collars. There was no blood feud. No one had hurt anyone else's family members. No one had insulted anyone else's family members. It was well, just... now, they, they did a lot on the YouTube videos that we didn't get to see because they weren't on television. Again, I, I thought it was a great, it was, th that's the dichotomy for me. It was a brilliant dog collar match, but it was hard for me to understand why. Why was there a dog collar match? Why were the guns given the heads up before FTR that they could announce it by pulling the dog collars out of the stockings? Well, remember we talked about that? Why, why did they give the graphics department the heads up before they gave, told the people it was in the match they were going to be in the match? But we can't. Then all we'd be doing is tearing everything apart. If we tried to make Tony Khan's booking make sense, I'm just trying to appreciate the work of the boys. Well, let's stay on the topic of Ring of Honor for a few minutes here. Uh, Tony did a press scrum after the pay-per-view event. We're not going to play any audio from that to give people Thank a, you. a break after last week's debacle. But I do have a press release here issued by Ring of Honor. Tony Khan announces relaunch of Ring of Honor's Honor Club platform. More than two decades of Ring of Honor content now available for $9.99 a month with new pay-per-view and TV content to come. And that is really one of the big stories there. The idea that he announced there will be Ring of Honor TV in 2023. However, as of this point, it will only exist on Honor Club. What are your thoughts on that? Well, but then there's not really television the honor club goes back to the original concept when sinclair broadcasting bought the company we said we have this at the time the tape library was what uh nine years older we've got nine years of this tape library internet pay-per-views have just become a thing we have a large Internet audience, Ring of Honor was the same as AEW in, in terms of the, the internet involvement was heavier in, in Ring of Honor fans or in AEW fans than it is in your general WWE fans. What is, so point is, we all said go after the internet audience. They may not be able to come and buy a ticket in Chicago or in fucking Philly but they could watch the internet pay-per-view or they can watch the house shows that ring of honor was already recording each house show for DVDs to so put it on the internet, make them pay to see this programming that they can't get any other way, or at least live or in a timely fashion and make it affordable. And you get all those fans. And that's, of course we got Greg, the office boys, college friend was the one that built the website and go fight live and all that stuff. But that was the original idea. That's a no brainer. You've got all that content and you've got an audience that is predisposed to be on the internet, and watch shit on the internet and blah, blah, blah. I know a lot of people do it now. A lot less were doing it 12 years ago, but it's same principle. These are the people who want to see these things and they've got a lot of content. So that can generate some income, but not obviously enough to pay a roster of wrestlers and, and all this, this other, you know, ancillary stuff that goes into running an actual promotion. If he's just going to do a television show like they're doing the YouTube AEW Dark or whatever it is and put it on their own service, then, yeah, it's a TV show, but it ain't really on television. And then there's an element of preaching to the choir. 
where is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Are the only people that see that going to be the ones that are already wanting to look for it? Or the, you know, eh, eh. well, here's another That's, thing. If you're going for streaming, if you're willing to put up the money and film television shows just for streaming, which we're assuming he's going to do, is it worth it putting it behind a nine ninety nine paywall and X amount of people will see it or putting it on YouTube and opening it up so multiple people can see it and maybe spread it? If you're well, at that, that point where you're thinking about doing something for streaming, is it worth actually hiding it behind a paywall? Yeah, see, that's that's the thing is, if you want a bunch of eyeballs on your product, you put it on YouTube, and there's some revenue to be derived there. But ag again, you probably get more money per head putting it behind the paywall on Honor Club, but it would be less number of heads. And the thing is, is that Unless you're you get to the status of the WWE and and you know people now know well I'll just type in WWE and go to the network see everything that's ever been done. The catalog, the back catalog of a any wrestling promotion should be something that that promotion is monetizing secondarily to their main program, their main you know, income, whether it be ticket sell, sales or pay-per-view or TV ratings, TV rights fees, whatever, you know, he just, you can't start another wrestling company piggybacking off the television show for the wrestling company that you've already got, especially when, as we've talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months, He's overworked and overstressed to begin with and inexperienced on top of that and honestly ha is falling a fucking part. Tony Khan. With all this shit going on, you can see it. It's been happening. So if AEW was established after years and years and, and the program, if he had an infrastructure in place, if he had people like they do in the WWE, if something happens to any one person in the WWE hierarchy, somebody else will take over, for good or bad. Who would that be for Tony Khan, since he doesn't let anybody do anything else except talk to the boys he doesn't have time to talk to? My God, if if Tony is the example of the, the longtime wrestling fan and the expert then what would it be like for all these jackoffs and yahoos that have either just seen wrestling because Tony bought it or the trampoline cowboys that would have free reign then to just hire all their friends. That's what I'm saying is if you, if he'd established this thing for years and years, AEW and the program was good and consistent and the booking made sense and the talent got over more after they came there than they were when they first showed up, which almost never happens there. Then you could start talking about, launching a second promotion or helping restore a second promotion on your strong television. But uh, this is just all getting messy. So it's wonderful that all those Ring of Honor uh, tapes and all of the library can be seen. But the question becomes again, what is the, what, how in the world is this going to work out over the next couple or three years? Well, we will find out, and of course, over the next couple or three years, there's a good chance that you may get hairy, and you may need to take care of that. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to apologize for the black hole of transitions. You know, how long does it take you to get hairy? It takes me about four to five weeks after I've trimmed everything before I start noticing that it's it's curling up and it's getting in, in places. And it's itching and everything. Folks, it's also the holiday season. And it's time for the clean balls. Fa la 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 la. But thanks to the folks at Manscaped, from stocking stuffers to white elephants this year, folks, you're going to be going from eggnog to nice hog. That's what they say. 
Manscaped is a one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. If you've got stinky crotches or crummy crevices or things in the way of the goodies that you might be uh, using on Christmas Eve, if Santa gets to come down the chimney, courtesy of the permission of your significant other. And if you go to manscaped.com right now, they've got the perfect gift in the Platinum Package 4.0. Folks, we've been talking about that. A plethora, a cornucopia of personal grooming items, but there's also loads of little presents perfect for stocking stuffers from our friends at Manscaped. The shampoos, the body washes, the upstairs and downstairs deodorant. There's even deodorant for the roof. Don't get me started on the stuff in the basement. They've got gels and exfoliants. You don't let your chestnuts roast in the wrong boxers. Get them a pair of the Manscaped boxers. And that'll keep the boys cool and comfortable for the holidays and all year round. If dad's got nasty nose hairs, you can save that problem with the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The Shears 2.0. It's a full kit for nail care with scissors, clippers, tweezers, and a file. And that comes in handy if you ever get arrested and thrown in jail while you're on the go. Then all you got to do you'll be right out. They'd probably clear your pockets or take everything you have before you got put into a jail cell. Yeah, but see, the Shears 2.0 is, it comes in the little kit and it's small enough to shove up your anal cavity for when you go into jail. And then, about 24, 36 hours later, you pop it right back out and you're trimming your nails and you're tweezing things and you're filing those bars. There's the new Preserve Cologne that brings a light, breezy, woodsy feel. You'll feel light, breezy, and woodsy. You'll have the breath of an owl, but you'll smell like a tree. And you can also use the body buffer. What's the matter with Go you? Go ahead, you, you have never... the breath of an owl. You have the breath woodsy owl. Give a hoot, don't pollute. And you can throw out your disgusting old loofah. I wonder if Riho uses a loofah and you can get the body scrubber that uh, exfoliates all that dead bacteria from your carcass. And folks, top off the stocking stuffing with the crown jewel for the family jewels, the lawnmower 4.0. I just used that the other night. It had been a while. And I'll tell you what, that uh, LED light that comes on, it really helps out because you got to, as you get older, especially you got to get in a variety of convoluted positions to do the things that need to be done with the lawnmower 4.0. And that light helps immensely to backlight when you've got your right arm around your left knee and you're bent over with your head stuck between your legs. So you can kiss your ass goodbye. If you don't get your dick shaved by Christmas folks again, right now go to manscaped.com slash J C E. That's going to be 20% off and free shipping for anything on, on the site at manscaped.com slash JCE, 20% off and free shipping. And you'll clean everything up, whack everything off, and maybe get whacked off in return this Christmas and New Year's. And don't forget about New Year's. The last thing you want to do is have a stinky crotch for New Year's. Because like Mama Cornette used to say, if you have a stinky crotch on New Year's Day, you'll have a stinky crotch all, all year long. She used to say something Did like that. Did she really I, say that? Come on. She didn't really say that exactly. She said, what you do on New Year's Day, you'll do all year long. So always be nice to people. That's what she used to say. But it would help if you shave your crotch. Manscaped.com slash JCE. That's right. And Jim, before we, for whatever's going on here continues this week, I want to ask you about a rumor that's going around. A few days ago, the rumors started that WWE is planning on, for WrestleMania 39, Brock Lesnar versus Gunther. What are your thoughts? I saw... Uh, it's too early for me to be optimistic. I saw that on Twitter, but I don't, uh, I don't know what source it came from. Remember, I've talked about, in the past, that would be a great matchup. And it would help Gunther, especially if Brock is into it and, you know, and, and works on getting him over. But they're really, 
even though they're completely different people and completely different styles, et cetera, et cetera, they're two of the only guys in the WWE that really should work with each other because they're two of the only guys that are never phony or goofy or winking at people. They're completely legitimate in how they act as themselves and what they do. Everybody knows that Brock's the real deal, which has enhanced his, you know, reputation and aura and, as Finkel would say, demeanor. And Gunther, I've said, is the most perfect wrestler in the business today for wrestling and working and talking and doing things that he should do if he was really who he's purported to be. And they're both physical, and they can both hit, and they can both work. I think it would be great, and that could elevate, especially... I know they don't do it often, but they have had Brock do a job or two, and I would fucking have Brock Lesnar put Gunther over. And I think that would be a big fucking deal. Do you see that as a WrestleMania quality match? Well, definitely. I mean, you know, I'm not saying if they've got if they've got Roman and The Rock, that one probably ought to go on last. I'm not saying that Gunther and Brock Lesnar alone would be a huge money draw as a main event for one of the two nights, I'm saying that it would be a great match to be featured on one of the two nights, and it would pay dividends for Gunther if he was to go over. And and you would create some uh, uh, possibly a new top-level guy that they need badly. And so I definitely think it ought to be alone right there it's it would probably be one of the better in-ring matches that they can field off of their roster so that makes it belong on wrestlemania and i think because brock lesnar right now is in it it would be a high level wrestlemania match because he's one of the biggest draws in the business and i think that if they gave them time and gunther's made to not only look competitive but just every bit as good as as brock then it would help him out in the future because it would get Gunther to a better place. But that's just me. We have a question here sent to CourtneyDriveThru at gmail.com. Hey, my name is Cody, and growing up, I would go to my grandpa's house in Mel- in Metter, Georgia. Excuse me. His Wait a minute. Me- how, do you, how do you spell that? M-E-T-T-E-R? Metter, Georgia. Okay. I, I've actually, I never met her. I just talked to her once or twice. His neighbor I met when I was little was Mr. Fantastic. Can you tell me who he was? <laughs> I can't find him anywhere. Possible Georgia territory. So, Jim, what can you tell Cody about Mr. Fantastic? Well, he was fantastic. Uh, he really was. Um, actually, you know, his real name was Reed Richards. And he was the leader of this band of astronauts that went up in space and got gamma radiated. One of them turned into a human torch. One of them became the invisible girl. And one of them turned into Ben Grimm the thing. That was Mr. Fantastic. Who's the worker of the group? I always thought the worker was really the the torch because he could, you know, the thing was just the... Well, he was young and he's agile. Whereas the thing was just kicking people's ass and, you know, pure brute force, st- stomp and kick and punch kind of match. But the torch could sell. He could fly. He was probably the worker. If you wanted to get the most action, you'd go with that. Uh, but never the, no, I don't have the first flying clue who Mr. Fantastic was. And I'm not saying that he was pulling your leg, but if you had been walking crooked or sideways since you were a kid. That might be because of growing up next to this guy pulling your leg. I mean, it's Mr. Wonderful. And if you're a kid, maybe you forgot that it's wonderful and not fantastic. He's from Georgia, right? Well, that may be true. Possibly he's good. But then wouldn't you know him as Paul Orndorff more than... No, if you're a kid, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Fantastic. Well, but he can't find him anywhere on the fucking internet. Because he doesn't know what to look. He only knows him as Mr. Fantastic. Has there well, been a, I, has there been a Mr. Fabulous other than the Blues Brothers in wrestling? Um, the Fabulous Blondie, oh, uh, oh, goddamn it, uh, um, 
Ken Timms? Oh, shit. Ken Timms. Thank you. I was trying to say Tim Woods. That way. <laughs> Ken Timms is what I was trying to say. I mean, you know, you hear all this uh, this all the time, though, because I've told a story one time What a, a heating and air guy came over here and saw one of my posters on the wall, the mass superstar from Greensboro versus whoever, Crockett. Oh, yeah. I grew up next to the mass superstar in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I said, well, that's not the same guy this guy is from. Oh, well, this guy was the original mass superstar. Oh, okay. Well, that settles that. Everybody that wants to impress a kid in their neighborhood or did back in the territory days would say, yeah, I used to wrestle as so-and-so, and I fought Jerry Lawler and Dusty Rhodes and this guy and that guy. Who knows? All right, Jim, we have a few Chris Jericho-themed questions that have been sent in. Yeah, boy. This one sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com is from Jesse in Memphis. On a recent episode of Talk is Jericho, Chris Jericho was asked about the decision to bring Colt Cabana back and if it had anything to do with CM Punk. <laughs> His response was, and this is in quotes, We wanted to bring Colt back onto the show. Reintroduce him. He had a pretty rough year as well. He's a former Ring of Honor champion. Always enjoyed his work. A very solid worker. And it was fun to have him back. And that's the reason why he came back. Solely. It was just because we wanted to have him on the show and reintroduce him. He hadn't been on TV in a while. End quote. <laughs> and he hadn't been on TV again. Especially in recent years, Jericho has proven himself to be full of shit on numerous occasions. But does he really expect us to believe that this was the sole reason they chose Cabana out of all the former Ring of Honor talent that was available to them? I would like to hear Jim's thoughts on Jericho and his comments. Is there any way possible that after 30 years in the business, Chris Jericho had no clue fans would have this reaction? No, no, there's not. Because he knew what the reaction was going to be, because that's why they did it. Even Uncle Dave came out and said it. Well, it's obvious what happened here. As soon as they thought they could get away with it, they got in Tony's ear and said, oh, and it fit the MO that Jericho was working. Oh, yeah, he's a former Ring of Honor champion of some description, the TV title or whatever. So they could actually convince Tony, who is obviously susceptible to believing the lies of his friends. No, oh, yeah, just it fits the angle. And they brought him back specifically to give Punk the finger, which we talked about at the time. Why would you do that to a guy that is known to not take disres public disrespect well and has a real good case for a lawsuit? Why you want to poke the bear? And the answer is because it's not their money. It's Tony Khan's money. And they couldn't resist. It, twinkle Toes, old Kenny Olivier, went and did an interview with some big website and said, oh, we just need to move on past this. It's not punk versus the elite. We need to think about the fans. And then the next Wednesday night on TV, he and his two little buckaroos are doing things to mock the fight. He's biting the other guy's arm, and they're falling trying to do the buckshot lariat. They say one thing, and the, the apologists and the delusional people who believe them lap it up, and then they do the exact opposite, and then say, oh, I, well, no, no, it's just, we're just working or whatever. But no, and that's another reason. How many weeks of TV did Jericho get to defend the Ring of Honor world title on? It had to be six, eight weeks in a row, right? Okay. Does anybody think it's coincidental or just amazing how this worked out that Chris Jericho got to defend uh, the title against and beat in the middle of the ring a different former champion of some description every week on TV for six or eight weeks on national cable television on TBS with at least by their standards, a lot of people watching, anywhere from 750 to 900,000, give or take the week. But when he does the, including, didn't he already beat Claudio on television? Beat him somewhere. He won the title from Claudio. There you go. But when it comes time to drop it, oh, I'll be happy to drop that title to Claudio. 
on a fucking Ring of Honor secondary pay-per-view that may not be seen by 75,000 people, much less 750,000, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday where, I mean, that's, you know, the, the news dump is the weekend where the, anytime the government has something they don't think people will take to, or anytime a big business has something people don't think they want to take, they'll dump it out on Friday after all the news outlets close down, see if they can slip it by. It's the same thing. He got eight weeks of self-ego-stroking wins on television, including a chance to say fuck you to CM Punk, who he's been undermining behind the scenes constantly. And then he drops it where the fewest people will see it. And then I bet you there will be no rematch on TV where he puts Claudio over in front of God and everybody. What do you think? I think Chris Jericho is the master manipulator of, of AEW since AEW's existence. Since its very beginning, Chris Jericho yep. has outplayed everyone. And again, if you're a Chris Jericho fan, what I'm saying isn't a negative thing. He's just, he's outplayed everyone. He's got Tony wrapped around his finger. You should hear about this new contract he's got. It's the most ridiculous thing in wrestling history that you only get if you have the owner wrapped around your finger. Yeah, I remember when they announced it was going to be for 10 years. I, well, how... What's Chris going to be doing in the ring when he's 62 years old? Getting $9 million is what he'll be doing. But Chris Jericho's work has been horrible. And Tony lets him do everything he wants. And he's let him kill too many shows. He's let him kill too many programs. Eddie Kingston was one of the hottest things in the company. And then he wasn't. MJF, you want to talk about, you always say he's a generational talent. He overcame a year of Jericho. A year. A year of the worst booking ever. <laughs> which which he then turned around and talked about afterwards. Yeah. I got through that when he was listing all of his grievances about how everybody had taken his spotlight away. That's the thing I don't get. At this point in time, just admit it. Yeah, I didn't like punk. And me and Tony thought the cabana thing would be a good idea. I was talking to Tony. We decided to do it. I don't like punk. That's all you got to say instead of, oh, no, it's just. He hasn't been on TV, and he had a rough year, and <laughs> and no one was clamoring for him. I mean, just keep going if you're going to list the reasons why he was on that show all of a sudden. Well, and, and then what's been preventing him from being on the show since then? Because it, it wouldn't be funny anymore to them. Let me ask you another question about Chris Jericho, because a lot of them come in. A lot of people have actually found him to be entertaining slash out of his mind, and they enjoy sending this stuff in. This one was sent to Courtney Drive through at gmail.com from John in Cincinnati, and it says, not that one. <laughs> I wanted both of your opinions on his podcast recently, Chris Jericho, with no guests or opposing voices, essentially said 2022 was possibly his best year ever. And Meltzer and many others thought he was 2022's Wrestler of the Year. What? He droned on... <laughs> He droned about star ratings, etc. Obviously, he's not 2022's Wrestler of the Year, but who is? Based on activity and his base, I regret to say that perhaps Moxley was. MJF was gone for a while. Sami Zayn might be an option, but could it actually be the plumber? What do you think? So I guess there's two questions there. Who do you think is the Wrestler of the Year, but is Chris Jericho the Wrestler of the Year? Well, of course not. Um... I mean, it's not even a knock on Jericho that, no, his matches don't look like they did now that he's 52 when he was 32. It's ridiculous. And star ratings. Again, it, 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 Uncle Dave went nuts a few years ago and just decided to start giving his friends a bunch of ratings, but we've already talked about he's given girls' matches ratings that Flair and Steamboat never achieved. And so... The star ratings that Chris Jericho gets now versus 20 years ago, everybody else's are inflated. It's like inflation. Used to be a dollar a gallon, now it's three dollars a gallon, whatever. But when when the the person who wrote in, not that John from Cincinnati, do you know who he's talking about? John in Cincinnati, John Moxley. No, oh, I th well, I I thought old John Mills. John Mills from Cincinnati was a piece of work, too. Point being, 
since he mentioned Sami Zayn in there, you're not just sticking with AEW. In that case, if it's opened up to have the wrestler of the year, is if it's not Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar, it would have to be Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar, wouldn't it? Or possibly, I don't want to say Logan Paul. Um, he wrestles but, as often as they do. Anyway, yeah, yeah, but the the... <laughs> The 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 biggest star in the biggest company that's drawn the most money is usually the wrestler of the year. And I mean, have they had a wrestler of the year in AEW? They really haven't. Nobody. Yeah, who are the candidates? Moxley, like he said, MJF, and he pointed out MJF was off TV a long period of time, and he hasn't had a lot of matches. Punk. And there's nothing since September, and he was injured before that, so it's really just based on the first six months of the year. Omega, even if you're an Omega fan, he was out. Adam Cole was out. Wardlow, definitely not. <laughs> AEW may not have a candidate at all. In AEW, it's none of the above. In the WWE, it's, you know, one of the... It would have been Cody, probably, if he hadn't got hurt, because that was catching fire already and you know next year it may be it may be cody again if he comes back and they do the same thing that uh that they were gonna do or who knows it may be punk next year just in a more professional situation because i can't imagine why they wouldn't be fucking driving the brinks truck down to chicago with all that's going on if they really want to make AEW look stupid uh, but I, I don't see a lot. I mean, you know, there's wrestlers of the year that you could see being the wrestler of the year. We just talked about Gunther and, and we, MJF, whatever the, but nobody's really be, had the opportunity, been injury free, not been in the subject of chaos or controversy backstage or been off for extended periods of time. So maybe there is no wrestler of the year. Jim, our next question, one that was a popular topic, sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from William Molina Jr. JR laid it down thick on John Laurinaitis and would like your comments on what JR said about John Laurinaitis since Jim enjoys torching Johnny Ace. Here's a quote from Jim Ross I had a hard time as time went on trusting Laurinaitis. That's sad to say. I hired him. I gave him a job when he needed it. I don't think he treated me quite right. He just wanted to show Vince that he was a better manager than JR and all these things. So now his ass is without a job and he <laughs> deserves the goddamn misery that he's living, <laughs> that I perceive that he's living. And I don't like, excuse me, and I didn't like how he treated me. So we've heard you talk a lot about Johnny Ace over the years. What do you think of Jim Ross's comments? Well, I mean, that says a lot. Um, the guy, he wanted to be a big-time corporate executive in the corporate world, and he wanted to wear suits and smile and say yes a lot to the people that were important and employing him. That's so why we said, you know, the same thing with Mrs. Baba liked him because he was a cute blonde guy, Gene. Stephanie liked him because he agreed with her a lot. Whereas JR would go to Vince and say, well, here's my opinion, and he'd tell the truth. John Laurinaitis just sucked up, back bit, backstabbed, and talked up to people that he wanted to suck up to. And he, like JR said, he is the one that hired him. And then he turns around and he starts going behind JR's back and putting the mouth on him, as Dennis Cordeluzzo would say, or whatever. He wanted to, John Laurinaitis wanted to keep his job and make sure that he was taken care of rather than giving an actual legitimate opinion in most cases. And he wanted people to know or to think that he was a great executive and a big expert and blah, blah, blah. And I'm saying, and, you know, J.R. gave him more of a fucking, not a chant, but J.R. gave him more benefit of the doubt than I did because, and I think J.R. has even said this in the past, I always saw John Laurinaitis as Johnny Ace of the Dynamic Dudes. And I could not 
neither get that out of my mind, nor could I accept or agree with or go along with John Laurinaitis, Johnny Ace of the Dynamic Dudes, telling me anything about the fucking wrestling business. Jim Ross, yes. Johnny Ace, no. So just because they like people who like to wear suits and look good in them that smile a lot and say yes, I'm sorry that Jim Ross was a wrestling executive. Johnny Ace was a stooge in a suit. Do you think Johnny Ace will ever work in wrestling again? Well, at this point, I think we talked about this when he was fingered, so to speak, in the in the fallout from Vince's illegal paralegal. Does he why would he need to at this point? He had a job with them most time for the last 15 years. Is he a complete imbecile with his money? Why would he ever have to work again? If you've been an executive with the WWF for 15 fucking years and you need a job in the next 10, you've either got a meth habit or a gambling problem. So I and and he's almost as old as I am. So I don't see why he would, but I don't see anybody clamoring for his serve. What does he do? Everybody said, well, he was a great finish guy. He was? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're talking about, well, he learned all those finishes in Japan. Would he work for it? Good, then go to Japan and book the finishes. Because booking finishes in Japan and the United States is two different fucking things. I'm, you know, I'm not even... I liked his brother. like both of his brothers. Don't know where Mark is these days. Um, he lied to me when, when I was in charge of OVW and he was in charge of talent relations and he was a pain in the ass and he never exhibited that he had any exceptional knowledge of wrestling, either it's history or how it works or finishes or angles or promos or whatever. The only time I ever saw him get any heat as a performer was when he came down and guested on OVW television. Then he was the hottest heel in the company because I had made him the fucking blame for when all of our OVW talent got called up to the main roster and got stupid gimmicks and rotten names. I finally had to say, well, the executive of talent relations, John Laurinaitis, is at the root of this. And so that's the only time that people actually ever gave a shit about Johnny Ace on the program as a talent either as a baby face or a heel and his whole career was when he was a goddamn heel in OVW. The people really did fucking hate him because they blamed him for ruining all their favorite wrestlers. But uh, otherwise, no, I, I don't, I don't never have seen any wrestling expertise in John Laurinaitis. If there was one wrestler in OVW more than any other wrestler that you think would have a lawsuit against Johnny Ace for just damaging their career, the career that could have been, you could only pick one. Who would it be? Who will? Hold on. Is it, does one count if it's a tag team? Because the, the Bashams, once they were saddled with that fucking Linda Miles, that was it. They, they cool young guys that could work their ass off in tremendous physical shape and that looked great and a hell of a tag team. And they get a rotten manager that gets featured over them. And uh, there you go. I think, yeah, I, th I think that may be the, the, the I mean, there's a bunch of them, but that may be the topper. And it's not like they fucking wanted to go along with it because Dinsmore wanted to go along with the Eugene thing. I hated that even worse, but he wanted to go along with it. So it's partially his fault. The Bashams didn't want any part of Linda Miles or all that fucking stupid shit they were doing. And those are the good days because you had a, couple of years where almost the entire class was either not used or misused or the hair was cut or Dolph Ziggler may be the only remaining one out of everyone that uh, well yeah the, the main the, roster the spirit squad got slaughtered on mass they uh you know the Jeter and Mondo were the victims of that because they should obviously still be in high positions today in the business that was 20 years ago but yeah so, yeah, I don't think anybody's beating the door down for Johnny Ace to come and do anything on their wrestling program. But let's go back to this lawsuit. If you were a wrestler and you were one of the ones that could sue and you wanted to sue, who could you sue with? Oh, well, now you're trying to do one? And it was so slick I didn't even fucking realize it. I know. Well, in that case, let's just get right to the meat of the matter. I'll tell you the son of a bitch to call. Stephen P. News. If you need to see. And outlaw much 
show or two. Still to the rest. Folks, it's just, it's come to this that I can't even listen closely enough to Brian last to pick up on these odd and obscure transitional points. But nevertheless, I'll tell you who can pick you up and dust you off and start you all over again. If you've been maligned, mistreated, lied to, damaged, harmed, hurt, or even starved to death, son of a gun, he'll do something for you about it. And that's our man, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. And Brian, you know where Stephen's headed next. He's going down to my old stomping grounds, down to the Mid-South Territory, Louisiana Lookout. Stephen P. New shook the corridors of justice in West Virginia and shook Governor Jim Justice up at the same time. He had a state of emergency declared over in West Virginia not long ago. And Louisiana, you're next on the list. Brian, there is an energy company down there, and I'm going to have a lot more details next week because I was hearing this story from Stephen. I said, I've got to, you got to jot these names and things down for me because what a story this is. One of the big energy companies down there, they got hit by Hurricane Katrina. A lot of people suffered. They lost power. The grid was off, blah, blah, blah. They said, we're not going to let this happen again. You just give us a bunch of million dollars in government money and we're going to fix this thing so that no hurricane's going to blow it over. And that's what they did. They got the money from the government and they, instead of performing the repairs and replacements that they were supposed to, they gave a bunch of bonuses out to the big wigs, to the bosses, the head honchos, the chief cooks and bottle washers, and didn't upgrade the power grid and the infrastructure. And along came, the what, what was it, a while back? There's been so many hurricanes. Hurricane Buford. Hurricane Buford came through. They're only 90-something mile-an-hour winds. They were supposed to have this thing proofed up to where it could withstand 150-mile-an-hour winds, 90-something miles an hour. Whole goddamn thing collapses. People without power for weeks at a time. People on respirators. People in home health care. People on the CPAP machines couldn't get a good night's sleep. Some of them, they couldn't wake up. And it's all because of the greed and avaricity, avariciousness, avariciosity of the big energy companies and all these big business people. And that's the kind of pompous asshole that Stephen P. New likes to take down. And there's going to be big news Coming out of the state of Louisiana, shocking news about the power grid, electrifying, scintillating even. And after Stephen P. New gets finished with the folks down there in Louisiana, he can do the same thing for you. Even if your power grid is operating, just call Stephen P. New and just tell him your life story and he'll figure out some way that you've been screwed around and he can fix. 888-692-8084, the number to call, newlawoffice.com. Get even with Stephen. If you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. You know the rest. He's the consigliere, and he's going to be hes going to be the new kingfish down there in Louisiana. Governor. He's going to replace Governor Huey P. Long as the kingfish. <laughs> and you know, here's something else about Louisiana. I've said this for 40 years, because I lived there, and it was proven, and it was told to me, and I saw it in front of my eyes. Louisiana is the crookedest state in the union and has been for the past hundred years. Why every bridge in the state of Louisiana is named after a former governor, and every bridge in the state of Louisiana was built on a former governor's brother-in-law's property. I've been across the Governor Huey P. Kingfish Long Bridge. Son of a gun, they charged me to get on, charged me to get off. We'll just wait till they charge you for the Stephen P. New Bridge. I mean, you know, I've been charged a bunch of time to get off, but I've never been charged to get on. All right. Well, the bridge from West Virginia to Louisiana, the story will be continued in weeks ahead. Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. That's going to be a long bridge, too. Jim, let's get a question or two and get out of here. This next one was sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Paco in Westbrook, Maine. I was listening to an old episode, and you spoke about how talent should set up a match with their opponent based on who is where and how they are being showcased. 
My question is, how do you know or when do you know when to elevate a talent from jobber to beginning match or from mid card to main event card? What do you look for and how much time do you give the talent to show and prove? Thank you for the lessons and laughs. To show improve? Show and prove. Oh, show and prove. Um, again, there's no, like, formula. There's no, okay, you're going to put this guy in this position for six weeks and then blah, blah, blah. We mentioned on a, a show here recently, and there's a clip on a YouTube channel, about how bookers would, the difference in how they would instruct a guy on how to work with a guy and what his finish was based on the level of how much they wanted that guy to get over, whether it was a squash match or whether it was a, a competitive match, but he still loses or a competitive match and he wins or whatever the case. Sometimes it's all part of your plan, Smithers. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you bring a guy in with the thought that you're going to start him at the bottom because he's young and he, as he gets more experienced, you can tell that he's got the talent and he should develop and blossom to where you want to use him for a long period of time. And you're going to elevate him up the cards by, as he gets better and he gets more notoriety with the people, he's going to get bigger matches and he's going to start winning more. I did that with Candido and Smoky Mountain wrestling. You know, other times, a guy will be on the card. You just, maybe a booker likes a guy and he has been using him. And suddenly he either sees the guy doing something that's new or the people are starting to get into the guy a little bit more because he's got some charisma or just something about him or he's doing something. Or the booker gets an idea and say, you know what? This would be perfect. I could juice up old, you know, Donnie dipshit on the third match. If, if he joined the manager and, and, or he, you know, got this new attitude or change his gimmick up or whatever. So it could be an idea from the booker on how to take that guy from just a normal underneath wrestler and making him a bit more of an attraction. Or it could be because they see the the fans are enjoying him. Uh, Bobby Fulton did the same thing. Bobby Fulton came into Memphis in, I, I think it was 1981, maybe or late 81, early 82. As the lowest baby face on the totem pole, he had no gimmick. He had dark hair and tights and boots. And he was the youngest guy. He was the least experienced guy. But Dundee was the booker at the time. And Dundee liked him because Bobby worked hard and he loved the business. And you could tell there was something there. And he started, Bobby started working on his body and getting in better shape because he'd been a pudgy little young man. But then all of a sudden he's got, He's got arms on him, and he's got a tan, and the girls are starting to take to him. All of a sudden, he's turned 22, for heaven's sake. And so they start doing a little bit more with him and putting him in some angles. And you test the water with that to where maybe, you know, the, the guy on TV goes a little longer with the top heel than you would have thought, and the top heel gets a little frustrated, and the announcers start talking about it. And it doesn't happen overnight where suddenly a guy goes from zero to hero, but he starts getting better and his look changes and his presentation changes. And then that's why by the summer of 83, when Dundee got the spot to, to uh, go and book for Ole in Georgia that little bit, took a bunch of us down there, he put Bobby together with Terry Taylor as the fabulous ones offshoot, the fantastic ones. Because now, in a smaller territory, with an upgraded gimmick and the past year, year and a half of experience working with all these guys, Bobby Fulton was capable of, instead of being the low man in a good territory, he could be a top man in a startup territory. And that didn't work out, but that wasn't because of Bobby's work, it was because of the territory. But then, within six months, they bring the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers into Mid-South Wrestling and then into Dallas, and they get over because the people didn't see them as preliminary guys. They hadn't seen Bobby Fulton three years ago. They saw him now, what he's doing now, in a different place, being presented as a main event level guy with more experience behind it and, and the ability to carry it off. 
so that's there's all varieties of ways that you would move guys up or that you would change guys gimmicks and as they grew up and as they got older and as they figured out things to do and it, it, there's no one way to say that so i've said about 14 different ways there how do you know when they give up on someone and i'm not saying this is a perfect example of that but i remember in early 85 mid-south ed car boo thomas one of my favorite yeah. names one of yeah. these names that i'll never forget but he had a natural he had an actual wrestling background he's there for a reason but it never really went anywhere. How do you know when to give up on someone you're trying to either elevate or give a chance to give you a sign that they should be elevated? Well, you could when your booker goes out and sits in the arena and listens to the people and watches the matches, and either the match is not real good or the people ain't really caring or the opponent always comes back and go, God damn, it's like fucking pulling teeth. Get a match out of him. Or any or all of those together. Uh, Ed Carr Boo Thomas, and it, it was an odd name. It wasn't Edgar. It was Ed Carr. Ed that was Carr. his real name, Ed Carr, <laughs> E-D-C-A-R. And his nickname was Boo, Boo Thomas, because he was a wrestler and I believe football player from somewhere in the Mid-South region, maybe Oklahoma-ish or whatever. He's a young African-American kid. And a part of it was he was doomed because there was another black guy they were trying to push after Dog left even though they weren't trying to put him in the top spot right away, it was still just every, uh, fairly or unfairly, everybody was compared to dog. But also, sometimes the athletes from other sports, maybe they don't have the personality or the aptitude. As I recall, I don't know if it was a personality problem, maybe just an aptitude problem with picking up pro wrestling. Nick Goulas tried to do the same thing with a football player, and here's that, I don't know where they come up with those names, this guy's name in 1978 was Shawnee Bowen. Shawnee, S H A W N E Y, Bo B O, Win, W Y N N. Shawnee Bowen, who was a football star somewhere in Tennessee, I think. And they tried to push him, and he was a young black kid too. But there was no junkyard dog that he was coming after. He just was a lousy wrestler. And I mean, you know, there's uh, there's times that, that football players, real sports athletes that cross over, especially if they're from that area, a local college athlete or star that's already had publicity, they they get pushed over a regular guy because the promoter wants to capitalize as quickly as he can on, you know, this guy's name value that he had before he ever became a wrestler. But in the process, sometimes that rushes guys into positions they're not ready for. But, I mean, it's happened a million times where, you know, a guy will have a gimmick for a, a, a wrestler, a, a booker will, and he'll say, hey, do this, and it just doesn't work. And that doesn't mean that, that the guy was bad or anything, or sometimes it does, but sometimes the push or the presentation didn't didn't work. Sometimes, you know... You're stuck doing things. You need to do it with Prince Karis, the mummy. Well, I love the guy in the mummy outfit. I wouldn't have done the mummy if Rick Rubin hadn't wanted a mummy. And he did the best mummy that mummy could hope for, but people didn't want a mummy. So we put him back in the, in the crypt. Well, before people cry for their mummy, one last question here, Jim. This one was sent to corningdrivethrough at gmail.com. From Josh, my name is Josh, <laughs> from Martinez, California. My name is Josh! My high school football coach was a former wrestler. Oh boy. His name was Mike Huff, but I believe he went by the name the California Grizzly. Oh boy. He would rarely speak about his days wrestling, but he never really elaborated on details. I would like to know how the territories are laid out on the West Coast for the size of California alone, as well as Oregon and Washington, how many territories would have been established prior to the WWF? Again, a high school student wondering about his uh, coach, Mike Huff, well, the California Grizzly. Mike Huff, the cat. He was, he was partners with Mr. Fantastic. 
<laughs> they were a tag team. Um, good Lord. I mean, again, maybe at some point there's been an, a local indie show in California where Mr. Huff, I don't want Mr. Huff to get in a huff about us knocking him. Have you ever heard of this guy, Brian? No, I mean, there's a lot of indie wrestling. There's a lot of indie wrestlers all around the world. I've never heard of this guy. Well, yes. And and that's why it wouldn't have been somebody that worked the actual territories. It would be an indie show or an outlaw show. They had outlaw shows in California, especially Southern California, before they had them in a lot of the rest of the country, not only because the Mike LaBelle LA promotion went under earlier than some of the others, but also because the the influence of the Lucha guys coming in and doing un, unlicensed shows or licensed shows, but not under the auspices of the Southern California territory, even then. And then independence didn't Anton Ripper Leone ran a lot of Indies in California in the yeah. early mid late eighties because, and Roy Shire in San Francisco was going under also to answer your question. Now that we've just pissed you off, um, the territories in California were basically two. Northern California was San Francisco, Roy Shire, based out of the Cow Palace, but they ran regularly in all the territory, all the cities in Northern California. And then uh, Southern California, Los Angeles, was Mike LaBelle and Eileen Eaton, the Olympic Auditorium, and they ran L.A. and... What is it? You know, what's a San Diego and those parts south down there in Oregon was Don Owens in Portland for years. Washington was a variety of people at different points, whether it be Dean Silverstone or whoever, uh, depending on the, the time period. So there in three states were four full time territories from the what 50s through the 80s until, you know, everything started going sideways. But there was, you know, there were only two territories in California because even though it's such a huge state, there was really two major metropolises that they would base out of and then do spot shows in the rest of the towns. All right, well, with that, the drive through is closed. All right, more musical instruments in 2023 here on the Boy, show. you you need to work on your musicianship and your transitions. Well, of course, you can hear more. Actually, you can't hear any more musicianship or transitions, but you can hear the Jim Cornette experience when it debuts this weekend, wherever you find your favorite podcast, and of course, next week, right back here in the drive through wherever you find your favorite podcast, <laughs> the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll be the first thing that pops up. Full of episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, all with the very popular Travis Heckle artwork. If you like something on the show and you want to share it, go to the official Jim Cornette channel, get that clip and share it. Once again, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. If you want access to the archive of the drive through Any Experience going back to 2013, patreon.com slash Cornette. For only $5 a month, you get access to the archive, patreon.com slash Cornette. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, The Wrestling News at thewrestlingnews.com or look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Jim, what's going on at Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com? We're still selling stuff, but you probably won't get it by Christmas if you waited this long, but you will get it eventually, but we'll be closed from January the 1st through the 8th for restocking and refreshing and taking a breath, and happy 97th birthday, Dick Van Dyke, and sorry it didn't work out, penis van lesbian. At jimcornet.com. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until this weekend on The Experience, and next week right back here on The Drive-Thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!